as you're joining us here in Zoom or YouTube, please introduce yourself in uh, chat in Zoom or in the YouTube chat if you're joining us on YouTube. Uh, let us know your name, your affiliation, where you're calling in from, and what you're excited to learn about today. And as you're sending those chat messages, please make sure to send those to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your introduction. If you have questions for our speakers today, and we do have three talks from our NGLs today, Next Generation Leaders, please use that Q&A button down in your footer of Zoom. Uh, and make sure to include the speaker's name if the question is about a specific presentation so they know it's for them. We want those questions to end up in Q&A so we don't miss them. But we don't have live Q&A for those pre-recorded Allen Institute project talks during the event. So please head over to community.brainmap.org slash tag slash showcase 2020 or search for showcase 2020 using that magnifying glass to submit questions for those project talk teams after the event. If you're having trouble with Zoom, you can view this event via our live stream on YouTube, and we will put that, that link in the chat. Um, and, or you can try switching to phone audio to minimize your strain on your internet bandwidth. Here's today's agenda. We're going to be starting with one of our next generation leaders speaking. Um, and then we're going to have some more project talks and uh, next generation leader live talks today. We're not going to have breaks during today's program as it's being live streamed and recorded on YouTube. So you can catch up if you need to step away for a minute. We're going to get started right at the top of the hour. Welcome. Welcome back for those of you joining us again for day two of Showcase Symposium. And welcome to those of you joining us for the first time today. So please join the conversation here in Zoom or on YouTube. Introduce yourself using Zoom chat or YouTube chat. Tell us your name, your affiliation, what you're excited to learn about today, and make sure you are sending those messages to all panelists and attendees in Zoom. All panelists and attendees. For those next generation leader talks, we will be taking live questions. So please use the Q&A button down in the footer of your Zoom toolbar uh, to ask them questions and make sure to ask, uh, to include the speaker's name in your question so that they know that the question is for them. That question is for me. Will these talks be recorded and posted? Yes, you can find everything on YouTube. And for those Allen Institute project talks, those are pre-recorded and we're not going to have live Q&A here in uh, the Showcase Symposium. So please visit community.brainmap.org and click on the Showcase tag. We've pre-made some threads for you to ask those speakers questions about their talks and they are monitoring those threads and answering those questions. If you're having Zoom connectivity issues, please I uh, use the link that's in the uh, in the Zoom chat to connect using uh, YouTube instead of Zoom, or try switching to phone audio to minimize the strain on your bandwidth. And here's our agenda for today. We have some live talks from our next generation leaders, followed by some project talks going back and forth today. We don't have any breaks in today's program. It's being live streamed and recorded on YouTube. You can catch up later if you need to, uh, if you need to step away for a minute. Um, and then for the uh, people who are invited to the Q&A and roundtable uh, sessions, please note that is a separate Zoom link. All right, thank you everybody. We are just about to get started with today's showcase symposium, day two. Welcome. To those of you who are introducing yourself in the Zoom chat, thank you for introducing yourselves. We'd love if everyone can uh, chime in and let us know uh, who you are, where you're calling in from, and what you're excited to learn about today. I see excitement about the NeuroPixels pipeline coming up in the chat. And thank you to those of you who are sending those messages to all panelists and attendees. Please make sure you're sending your messages to everyone uh, or else just as panelists will see them. And we're excited to see who you are, but we'd like everyone to get to know each other. And please make sure those questions for our next generation leaders end up in that Q&A panel. Once that chat scrolls up in Zoom, it can get a little lost. So the Q&A panel will make sure that we see your questions and they get asked. 
For those project talks, please head over to our community forum at community.brain-map.org to submit questions for our project talk teams. They're not going to be taking live Q&A. Their talks are pre-recorded, but they are monitoring that forum uh, in order to give you answers to all of your questions over there. If you're having trouble connecting here on Zoom, if you're having bandwidth issues, your first option is to jump over to YouTube. The link is in the chat. Um, or to switch to the phone audio to uh, minimize the strain on your bandwidth. Um, all right, so here's today's agenda. We're not going to have breaks during the agenda today, so it's being live streamed and recorded on YouTube, so you can catch up after the fact if you need to step away for a minute. And I'm going to hand it over to Steph, our moderator for today. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, welcome everybody to day two of the virtual showcase symposium. Uh, I'm Stephanie Seaman. I'm a scientist in the synaptic physiology team at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, uh, and I'm gonna be your MC today. First up, I'm pleased to introduce our uh, first next generation leader, uh, Yvette Fisher. Yvette is currently a Hannah Gray postdoctoral fellow in Rachel Wilson's lab at Harvard Medical School. In the beginning of next year, she'll start her own lab as an assistant professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. Her research uses spatial navigation in fruit flies to understand how nervous systems flexibly process information. During her PhD with Tom Clandinin at Stanford, Yvette identified critical neurons and algorithms that allow the fly brain to perceive visual motion. She also built a generalizable genetic toolkit that allows target genes to be conditionally turned on or off in any cell type of interest. As a postdoc, Yvette solved the problem of how visual scenes map onto head direction cells in the fly brain, creating a sense of direction. Her ongoing work combines advanced genetic manipulations, quantitative behavioral analysis, in vivo whole cell electrophysiology, and calcium imaging to understand how the sense of direction can switch its mode of operation rapidly when contexts change. Her presentation is titled Flexibility of Visual Input to the Drosophila Compass, Compass Network. Uh, welcome to Yvette. Hello, and thank you so much, Stephanie, for that really lovely introduction. Uh, I have to say it's a huge honor to be included in this Allen Showcase and to be part of the NGL program. And I'm really looking forward to interacting with many folks at the Allen in the upcoming years. And so today I'm really excited to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing during my postdoc in Rachel Wilson's lab on the flexibility of visual inputs to the Drosophila Compass Network. And up front, I'd just like to acknowledge my fantastic co-authors in the Wilson Lab, Jenny Liu and Isabel D'Alessandro. So to set the stage, I want you to imagine that you're coming out of the subway in New York City. And as you get to your station stop and you come up to street level, you're a little bit turned around. And as you come up to street level and let's say then you look out in the distance and suddenly you see the Empire State Building, a landmark that let's say that you recognize. And suddenly you know which way is north. I like this example because I think a lot of us have had this, this experience where you're a little bit turned around in the world, but suddenly once you see a visual landmark that you know and recognize, your mental map kind of clicks back into place. However, how familiar landmarks are incorporated into our brain's representation of heading, which is the direction that we're facing in the world, is not well understood in any organism. And today I'm gonna to tell you about our work using the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, to start to get at this question. So to study the brain activity in navigating flies, what we do is we tether the fruit fly under the microscope so we can measure their brain activity while they walk on an air cushion ball, as I'm showing you here in this video. And then to create imp the impression of virtual reality, we track the rotation of the ball in real time and update the visual displays accordingly. So for example, if the fly were to make a turn to the right, 
we'd move the projected visual cues to the left to simulate the visual changes that would be caused by this turn. The other thing that you need to know is that the circuits that hold the fly's internal compass have recently been discovered. There's a population of neurons called EPG neurons within this donut-shaped brain region here that actually encode the heading direction of the fly. And here on the right, I'm showing you a reconstruction from electron microscopy of these EPG neurons created by the fly EM team at Genelia. And the dendrites of these neurons are actually arranged physically next to one another in a circle with adjacent cells representing adjacent angles of heading. And thanks to connectomics data sets like this, we now know the synaptic connections between all of these neurons and all of the other neurons within this brain region. And I have to say that this connectomics data, it's completely changing how we do systems neuroscience in the fly. And functionally, at a population level, what this network looks like is that at all times, there's a single, stable, and persistent, what's been called a bump of neural excitation or activity that flows within this network of neurons keeping track of the fly's current heading. This was originally discovered by Johannes Seelig and Vivek Jayaraman. And what they did is they expressed the calcium indicator G-CAMP specifically within these EPG neurons. And then you could actually watch the bump of activity swing around this network as the fly makes turns. And the way I like to think about it is, is if the currently most active neuron at each point in time is like the needle of a compass that's tracking the direction that the fly thinks it's facing. And these properties and others have led to the idea that this network functions like a ring attractor network, which is a re recurrent type of network architecture with a ring of continuous stable states that the network can transition between. And I think this is one really elegant example where in neuroscience where theory actually preceded experiments because theoretical models originally aimed to explain the properties of head direction cells in mammals has actually come out to predict many of the properties of the fly compass network. And what was really striking recently is that this theory even described how there should be precise wiring from self motion inputs that would need to exist in order to drive this brump of activity either to the left or to the right when the fly makes its turns to the left or to the right. And functionally, those exact circuit motifs have recently be, been described by the Jayaraman and Maiman labs. But what's really exciting to me about this network is that it uses multiple types of information to track heading, not just one. So for example, if the fly's walking around in darkness, when visual cues are absent, it uses self-motion information by integrating the fly's turns over time in a circuit that I was just telling you about. However, when visual cues are present, the compass often tracks those visual cues very faithfully. And this phenomenon originally reported by Selig et al has now actually been observed in a number of labs. And let me show you what that looks like in our hands. So here, this is calcium imaging data from these EPG neurons that are expressing G-CAMP. And what you need to know to watch this video is that the same neurons that have axons uh, in another brain region called the protocerebral bridge, this arch brain region here. But essentially, uh, and these are closer to the surface, so they're easier for our in vivo imaging. Essentially, this circular relationship has been unwrapped into an arch. And then we've denoted those regions of interest here within this video. And then as you watch the video, you'll see this bump of activity, and we're gonna decode it in real time back into circular coordinates because it's easier to look at. And the direction that the fly is facing in virtual reality will be shown with this blue arrow. And then we'll plot those values below. So watch every time the fly makes a turn, either counterclockwise or clockwise, how this network traverses, uh, kind of the bump of activity traverses this network following very closely the direction it, the fly is facing. And you can see these quantities track each other very nicely, the neural representation and the direction the fly's facing in VR. So 
the data that I just showed you was taken as a measurement when the fly was walking in virtual reality with a single bright bar as a reference. And you can see that even over a long one minute trial, these two quantity quantities track each other very faithfully. The flies VR in blue and the direction uh, decoded from the neural activity in red. However, I don't wanna give you the impression that these cells are purely visual because they're not. Because if instead we put the exact same fly in complete darkness, the compass representation still tracks the turns of the fly. You can see this really cl clearly at the beginning of this trial where the fly makes a really strong rotation movement and the neural activity follows. But even over a short period, when there aren't visual cues present to use as landmarks, the network begins to drift out of sync. And I think this makes sense intuitively to me and maybe to many of you, because you probably know from experience that if you walk around in complete darkness, you may have a sense of which direction you're facing, but you'll quickly become less precisely sure. And this leads me to big, the big question that we wanted to address. How do visual cues keep this compass accurate? I wanna understand this question, or in other words, another way to say this is, how does this compass network, which doesn't seem to require visual input, still use visual input when they are available to be more accurate? And how does it handle this task given the fact that visual surroundings can change over time? Because of this, we hypothesize that maybe the network exhibits some type of plasticity that would allow it to learn new visual environments when the surroundings change. And so to begin to explore this idea, we asked what happens to the compass when the fly's surroundings change within an experiment? And so for this, my colleague Jenny gave first the fly a baseline pre-training period of virtual reality where they walk with a single bright bar as a landmark. And here, we're showing you the neural activity of these EPG neurons over time, where every row shows the delta F over F of a single wedge in that compass region. And you can actually watch this bump of activity traverse the network as the fly walks. And then below here, again, we're showing the VR heading in blue and the decoded uh, direction of that neural activity in red. And we've aligned them from the beginning of the plot. And we'll keep that reference frame for the rest of this slide. And you can see that these quantities track each other very nicely, as I told you previously, when there's only one landmark around. We're also gonna define a quantity, which I'm gonna call the offset, which is the difference between the neural decoded angle and the VR angle. And all I want you to notice is that when these quantities track each other very nicely, the offset sits stably around a single value. And then what Jenny did is she changed the visual world for this fly and added a second bar 180 degrees apart. And what we see during this so-called training period is that as the fly explores, the offset, and I'm showing you just a representative snippet here, alternates back and forth between one offset that's very similar to what occurred during the pre-training period and another offset 180 degrees apart. And it continues to alternate back and forth between those values. And I wanna be clear, this is to be expected in itself does not require plasticity because this scene that we've given is completely symmetric and thus ambiguous. We think what's happening is that the network is switching back and forth between two interpretations that match best. But what does require plasticity is what we observed next. After 20 minutes of this training experience with two bars, we switch the fly back to a world with a single bar. And upon the return to the one bar world, we see a notable change compared to pre-training. Even though there's only a single bar present, we continue to see that two stable offsets consistently emerge and that the network switches back and forth between these offsets. And these two offsets are very similar to the two offsets that occurred under the two bar training condition. And to us, this argues that the visual scene with those two bars has actually left an imprint on the network that persists even when the fly is returned to a virtual environment with a single bar that should be consistent and stable. And over the next couple of minutes, the network will settle back down into a single stable offset. You can see in this example fly that happening here. And in some flies, we see that the offset settles back into the original offset, 
other flies it will settle into the newly reinforced offset. And then some flies we even see arbitrarily, seemingly arbitrary new offsets emerge. And I wanna say that we see a clear effect of this two bar training in about half of the flies that we measured. And I also wanna mention that in a companion manuscript to ours, Sung Soo Kim and Vivek Jayaraman and colleagues saw a very similar phenomenology during flight. And they also saw other complementary, very intriguing data, data that supports the idea of plasticity in this network. All right, so I think this calcium imaging data to us really argued that the compass can be persistently altered by changes in visual experience, but we wanted to know how does this actually happen at a circuit level? And so to, I need to introduce you to one other cell type to talk about this issue. So we know that visual information comes into the compass network from a population of neurons called ring neurons. And these are higher order visual neurons that receive visual signals that are relayed from the optic lobes. And individual ring neurons are activated by visual objects at specific visual positions, but different neurons respond to different object location. And as a population, they tile all of the fly's field of view and they seem very well set up to convey information about where visual objects are around the fly. And the fascinating thing about these ring neurons is they have this super interesting morphology. Each ring neuron sends a ring-shaped process into this compass brain region, contacting all of the EPG neurons around the network. And I'm showing you a really be beautiful image of a single cell, stocha single cell stochastically labeled one of these visual ring neurons by my colleague Isabel. Here's the cell body. This region here is the dendritic specialization where it receives the visual input. And then you can see this axonal like process sending uh, presynaptic specializations into this whole brain region. And thanks to the connectomics work this year from the FlyEM team at Genelia, we now know definitively that essentially every one of these visual ring neurons makes synapses on every EPG neuron in the compass network. And this anatomy sets up a really interesting circuit organization. Essentially, we have a pattern of all-to-all -all connectivity between all the ring neurons and all the EPG neurons. Here I'm schematizing this with this matrix, where essentially what I've done is I've unwrapped this array of EPG neurons here on the vertical axis in gray. And then on the horizontal axis above in magenta, I'm representing different ring neurons with visual responses in different horizontal positions. And then these small dots here represent inhibitory synaptic connections because these ring neurons are known to be inhibitory. But there's something a little bit strange about this circuit architecture that I'm depicting because if every single one of these synaptic connections is the same strength, then essentially spatial information is being thrown away because every compass neuron is receiving the exact same drive. So instead, we hypothesized that maybe while the anatomy looks all to all, perhaps functionally, the strengths of these connections onto the EPG neurons are actually uneven or patchy. And this would allow localized visual cues to influence which EPG neuron is most active at a time. So for example, if this specific ring neuron was to be excited by a visual cue in this location, because this ring neuron is inhibitory and this pattern of synapses that I've drawn where it makes strong inhibition onto many of the neurons, but sparse weak inhibition onto one of these EPG neurons that would actually encourage this bump of activity to flow to this location that is the least inhibited. And you can imagine from there then if the fly were to turn and now turn 180 degrees and be facing a different direction in its environment, now visual cues would fall at a different location on its retina, and this may activate a different ring neuron. And if the connectivity was set up correctly, as I have in this toy model here, you can imagine that that would now influence the bump of activity to reside on the EPG neuron that represents the fly facing 180 degrees in the other direction. And so this is a really interesting idea. How would these uneven synapses actually arise in the first place? We were really inspired by the theory work in the head direction network to think that maybe these uneven synapses 
are set up by associative synaptic plasticity. And for example, let me propose a way that could work. If there were to be associative long-term depression or the weakening of inhibitory synapses between coactive ring neuron and EPG neurons, this could help set up these synapses in a useful way. What this learning rule would mean, for example, is that coactivity would weaken this synapse here. And the weaker that this synapse becomes, the greater the tendency would be to send this bump of activity back to this location next time the network sees the exact same visual input. And in this way, a learning rule such as this would actually reinforce the connection between the animal's current view of its visual surroundings and its current compass representation. And essentially what I'm proposing is that the network is taking a snapshot of the view of each view of its visual surrounding from every angle. And then it's storing that snapshot in the strength of synaptic connections from this array of visual neurons. And now if this model is true, it makes a couple of concrete predictions that we were able to test. The first hypothesis is that if this is true, then individual EPG neurons themselves should actually have distinct and potentially localized visual responses that they inherit from this connectivity. And secondarily, if these synapses are in fact plastic, then these visual responses of these EPG neurons should actually be able to change over time with experience when these synaptic weights reorganize. And so we decided to turn to whole cell electrophysiology, which would allow us to more precisely measure this type of feed forward inhibitory input into the network. And so to explore these ideas, I used whole cell electrophysiology in vivo from genetically labeled EPG neurons. And the very first thing that I did is I wanted to make sure that I could still observe the compass tuning properties that had been seen previously using calcium imaging. So here I'm just showing you that that's, that's correct and we can. So what I do is I let the fly walk in virtual reality here with a single bright bar as the cue that's being moved every time the ball moves. And then I'm plotting an example EPG neurons membrane voltage over time. And you can see it's evolving over time. And then below I'm plotting the direction that the fly was facing in virtual reality. And I hope you can appreciate that every time the fly is facing one direction here, the cell is more depolarized and it fires these sharp small action potentials. That's what these sharp events are. And every time the fly faces in the other direction, the cell is much more hyperpolarized. And we see this across a consistent set of recordings. However, we wondered whether, uh, we wanted to understand, you know, what aspect of these responses that we see here, how much of that is actually coming from the visual input based on the position of this visual cue that's in virtual reality. And so, in order to study that, we designed an experiment that would allow us to isolate the visual contribution to this network. And so the way this experiment proceeds, now the fly has no control of the stimuli, but instead what we do is we flash a bar at a random location, then we remove that bar, flash it in another location, and so on and so forth, pseudo randomly, until we've flashed this bar at many locations around the fly multiple times. And what I found is that individual EPG neurons are strongly inhibited by cues flashing at some locations and not others. You can see this really clearly in this example on three different trials I'm showing in three different colors, that every time the bar is flashed at negative 90, the membrane potential of this cell drops, but the response to the bar flashed at zero or plus 90 is much more modest. And importantly, we confirmed that these responses are truly visual, because, and that they're not motor correlates, because they're really similar whether the fly is actively turning or still during these periods. And I wanna point out that these data are consistent with this example neuron receiving strong inhibition from ring neurons that respond to this visual location, but weak or no inhibition from these other visual locations. And interestingly, we found that different EPG neurons have very distinct visual tuning consistent with the hypothesis I put forward. And this was even the case for EPG neurons that innervate the exact same wedge within this compass 
in a subset of recordings, I was actually able to measure which wedge neuron I was recording from by looking post hoc at a biocyte and fill. And I'm showing you three really striking examples here of uh, neurons from different flies that were in this exact same wedge within the compass that have very desperate uh, visual tuning properties. And across a watch, much larger data set that I'm not showing you here, we see no significant correlation between the dendritic position of the neuron and its visual tuning. It also turns out that this visual tuning very well predicted the heading tuning that we would observe under the virtual reality mode, suggesting that at least under our experimental conditions, visual inhibition strongly shapes the network's responses. And I think together these data convinced us that this visual tuning and this visual input of this network, it's not hardwired at this level like a retinotopic map, but in fact, it varies dramatically from fly to fly. And having established a way to experimentally isolate the visual drive to this compass, we now were able in a position to test the second hypothesis. Do visual inputs change with experience? And so let me show you a very excited, uh, kind of striking example of what we can see. For this experiment, first, we give the fly a baseline period of virtual reality with a single bright bar. After many minutes of this experience, we then pause virtual reality and we measure the neurons visual responses using this flashing bar stimulus that I told you about previously. And here you can see for this example visual measurement that this cell is the most hyperpolarized when we flash the bar around plus 90. And then what we do is we switch the fly again into virtual reality with two bars, this time 135 degrees apart due to steric constraints on our ethos setup. And after about 12 minutes of this experience, we again pause virtual reality to measure the visual responses again. And following this virtual reality experience, for this cell, we observe that the visual tuning of this neuron completely shifted from being monophasic to being biphasic or having two peaks. I wanna point out that the distance between these two peaks is very close to the distance between these two bars. And I wanna emphasize this location here that was originally most inhibited and has now actually become excited following this new experience. And we'd like to propose that what's happened is that inhibitory synapses from ring neurons that are sensitive to this visual location have actually become weakened by this experience. And for full disclosure, I just wanna say, these experiments are extremely technically challenging. And so for the purposes of clarity in this talk, I'm showing you one of the most clear cut examples. And similar to the imaging experiments, we don't see a change in every fly uh, that we measure from. However, interestingly, over the full data set, we see that the EPG neurons that were the most modulated during this two bar training period, and that actually kind of participated most actively when these two bars were present, are the same cells that exhibit the largest visual response change. And to us, this correlation implies that perhaps visual remapping actually depends on EPG neuron activity. It's not enough just to expose the fly to an altered visual environment, but it seems like perhaps the visual cues actually need to directly interact with the heading representation within the recorded neuron. And so just to summarize, I'd say that taken together, our data is consistent with a model where the synaptic connections between a panel of visual neurons and these compass neurons can reorganize over the timescale of minutes to store the memory of the fly's current visual surroundings. And one of the reasons I'm really excited about this initial evidence of associative plasticity is in thinking about parallels to models of navigation in mammals. So similar to the central complex network, head direction cells and grid cells are also hypothesized to function as continuous attractor networks. And computational models have proposed for a long time that synaptic plasticity of sensory inputs could serve to keep these networks tethered to their current environment. But now that we actually have evidence for the location and the locus of this plasticity in this circuit, we're gonna be able to test these models for the first time at a mechanistic synaptic level.
And the other reason I'm really excited about the idea of synaptic plasticity is in thinking about multimodal cues. So today I focused exclusively on visual cues and I told you about visually responsive ring neuron inputs. But in other insects, it's been known for a really long time that ring neuron homologs can encode things like the angle of linearly polarized light or can be responsive to mechanosensory cues that might be informative about a wind source in the current environment. And it's been recently discovered that distinct ring neurons carry these tuning properties in Drosophila as well. So I think it's really interesting to speculate that by layering a number of these different sensory modalities from different populations of ring neurons, if they all exhibited this plasticity that I'm proposing, that this would actually allow the network to bind together a range of cues that are all informative to the insect about which direction it's facing. And what I think is really elegant about any model that uses associative synaptic plasticity is that what it means is that the cues that are most consistently informative in the animal's current environment will be the ones that will actually be learned the best at that moment. And those will be the ones that will have the largest impact on the heading estimate moving forward. And we're really excited in the future to begin to use this circuit as a model to uncover general principles about network flexibility. And so with that, I'd like to thank the people and the funding that contributed to this body of work. Again, thank you to my collaborators, Jenny Liu and Isabel D'Alessandro. And I'd especially like to acknowledge my postdoc advisor, Rachel Wilson, who's been an extremely supportive mentor. And finally, then I'd like to say, I'll be opening my own lab at Berkeley this summer. And if you're interested in any of these topics and you'd like to talk more with me about this research and where it's headed, I would actually absolutely love to be in contact with you and please get in touch. And thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Yvette. That was super interesting. And I can appreciate how, uh, how hard those electrophysiology experiments are. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in, so we'll just start firing them off. The first one is from uh, Stephen Smith. He asks, what about compass function in a totally dark reared fly? Is there anything analogous to mammals early spontaneous in the dark retinal waves in flies? <clears throat> Oh, I love that question so much. Okay, there's a lot there, so let me try to unpack it. So I guess first I'll answer the second part of the question, which is there is a recent report, this really beautiful work in the fly visual system from the Zapersky lab, where they're starting to see things during late stages of fly development that look similar to retinal waves. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating idea to speculate that these retinal waves may kind of make their way through into the central brain and affect uh, this compass network, but nobody has looked yet, but I would love to. This is something uh, I'm actually thinking about doing. Uh, so I love that question. I guess your other question then, which is, uh, have anyone done this in dark rearing? I piloted this experiment and I haven't done it extensively. So you'll have to take my anecdotal word from it, but uh, the plasticity I'm seeing, it seems to come online quite quickly. And so even in the time that I put them on the rig and the couple of minutes of experience when you start to do the measurements, it seems that uh, the visual responses can actually coalesce in that time. Uh, and so it's not so straightforward that there are differences, but I haven't extensively characterized the difference between dark rearing and not. Thanks for that question though. Awesome. Um, our second question comes from Forrest Coleman. Uh, he asks, do you have any reasons to suspect that these plasticity effects are pre or post synaptic in nature, such as how polydactyl are these synapses? Is it possible to tag and image molecular components of presynaptic terminals over time in these ring projecting neurons? Fantastic. Great question. Thank you, Forrest. Uh, so we don't know, but I would love to, and we're working on this now. Uh, I think there's some reason to hypothesize and our working hypothesis is that it may be presynaptic and I'll tell you why. So unlike in mammals, in the fly, there's only been one brain region that's previously been shown to exhibit associative synaptic plasticity in the adult fly central brain and that's within the mushroom bodies. And in the mushroom bodies, uh, these synapses display long-term depression-like effects, and that it, most of this is thought to be exhibited presynaptically. That's how the evidence uh, supports so far. And so 
uh, we're working to explore the hypothesis that this plasticity itself may also happen within these localized synaptic terminal, like presynaptic terminal regions of the ring neurons. Um, we have some, some ideas of how to look at kind of different tag things. And I'd love to talk more with Forrest offline about the specifics, but that's kind of still in progress. Great. Uh, our next question comes from Jane Wu. Uh, Dear Dr. Fisher, enjoyed your talk. Do you think that what is learned from flies restricted onto the imaging, uh, uh, imaging stage could be applied to freely navigating flies in long distance in the nature? In nature, what are the potential limits of the virtual walking fly system? Is it possible additional neurons or even circuits are used for long distance flying mammals or flying animals, sorry. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, unpack a couple aspects yes. of that. So I guess one thing that I think is fascinating and there's a ton of kind of caveats about working in this restricted preparation, but what's really great about working in fruit flies and in this central complex brain region is that this brain region is actually largely conserved across most insect species. And so there's lots of really beautiful kind of field work being done with dung beetles, with locusts and with desert ants. And so we know the capabilities of these insects and now people have a lot of, and I'd say kind of the fields coalescing along the ideas that uh, this is kind of a general navigational structure in most insects. And this is probably how it's working, uh, maybe with different priority to different cues, depending on the ethological niche of that particular um, animal, but there's really beautiful behavioral work in dung beetles that suggests that they're kind of learning about their visual cues on the time scale of minutes and then using those behaviorally during tasks out in the wild. I guess to answer your second question, which is, you know, is this circuit enough? Uh, what I've told you here is just a piece of the puzzle and the field's really moving fast, but there's a lot of exciting things to find. So if you wanted to, for example, know how far had I explored from a piece of food that I now need to go back to, I'll point out that what I've told you about today is just one piece of the puzzle because you need to know which way you're facing in the world, but you also need to know how far you've walked in each direction when you're facing. This is something people classically called path integration. And I think it's one of the most exciting questions in our field right now, which is can fruit flies path integrate? I think there's a decent amount of behavioral evidence that they may be able to, and people are looking for the neural substrates that may be downstream of the network I told you about that kind of combine this information about which direction I'm facing with other signals that tell you about where, how you've been walking or flying through the world to be able to do that type of integration. Awesome. Well, I think we've got time for one more from Nathan Gowans. He asks, do you think the electrical signals are actively propagating uniformly across the whole ring projecting neuron, or could there be some intrinsic asymmetry that could contribute to differences uh, in the responses in addition to the synaptic plasticity? Yeah, I love this question. So uh, this was actually my first model uh, for how, uh, before we knew what these ring neurons were actually doing, uh, you might imagine, and let me just unpuck that question, uh, that being at different parts along the ring may actually receive either different strengths of a signal that's propagating around or that may be at different delays. I can tell you that based on all of the correlation between the recordings from the EPG neurons and their visual tuning, that since we see absolutely no preference in where you are around that ring and which visual tuning you're going to have, and because we, in fact, we know most of those ring neurons in a piece I didn't tell you in a shorter talk, they're all ipsilateral. So the ones that come from the right are from the right eye and the ones that come from the left are from the right, the left eye. And so I don't think that that is the major driver here of the things we're seeing, but I can't rule out kind of interesting delays that, and kind of attenuation that may happen along this, but it's something that I'd be interested in looking into further. It's a really fascinating question. Great. Well, thank you for that talk, Yvette. That was awesome. Um, we've got a few more questions in the Q&A, um, but I'll let you answer those uh, via type uh, later, and we'll move on to our first uh, project talk of the morning uh, that comes from the NeuroPixels team. Uh, they're going to tell you about advances uh, they've made in the NeuroPixels pipeline, including launching the NeuroPixels behavior pipeline, uh, and how this work contributes to our understanding of the cortical hierarchy. So take it away, NeuroPixels team.
This talk will highlight experiments and analyses involving NeuroPixels probes, which are a new type of neural recording device that has been transforming the way that we study living brains. Uh, when I first arrived at the Allen Institute about six years ago, a uh, NeuroPixels project was just getting started. Uh, we had recently received a handful of prototype devices from IMEC, the nano electronics research hub that was designing and manufacturing these probes. Uh, before anyone had stuck one of these in a brain, there was plenty of skepticism about whether they would be useful at all. But after scientists at the Allen Institute, Genelia Research Campus, and University College London carried out the first recordings with NeuroPixels, uh, we knew we were onto something big. Um, the data quality was just so much better than what we were used to. Uh, NeuroPixels allowed us to record electrical activity from more neurons simultaneously uh, and to do it more reliable than was previously possible. Uh, so about three years after I arrived in, in 2017, uh, the initial characterization of these probes was published in Nature. Uh, here you can see an illustration of the entire NeuroPixels package. Um, it's able to pack nearly a thousand recording sites uh, along the, the long thin shank. Uh, which is what gets inserted into the brain. Um, here's a rendering of a probe embedded within the Allen Institute's biophysically realistic model of primary visual cortex. Um, this kind of gives you a sense of scale of the probe relative to the, the size of neurons. Um, the electrodes, uh, which you, you can kind of make out, are, are close enough that each extracellular action potential shows up on 10 to 12 recording sites, uh, which makes it far easier to distinguish spikes from nearby neurons. Um, and of course, this is only showing a, a small segment of the probe, uh, about a millimeter or so. Uh, in the actual experiment, the probe would extend much deeper into the brain. Um, because each NeuroPixels probe is 10 millimeters long, uh, it's possible to insert multiple probes into the brain at once without having adjacent probes collide into each other. Um, in order to, to better understand the inner workings of the mouse visual system, we wanted to record from as many visual areas as possible in a single experiment. Uh, so this cartoon uh, shows the, the configuration that we settled on where we had uh, each of six probes uh, targeting a different cortical visual area uh, and then of course extending down through hippocampus and into uh, visual thalamic nuclei uh, called LGN and LP. Um, and in order to achieve this we had to design a new rig uh, which would hold the six probes on independently movable manipulators uh, while the, the mouse was awake and, and running on a disc uh, and viewing um, diverse visual stimuli. Um, we modeled this rig after the one that was originally designed for the two photon imaging brain observatory, uh, but of course replaced the two photon microscope with NeuroPixels probes. And using this rig, uh, we were able to successfully record spiking activity from up to eight visual areas at once, uh, which is substantially more than what had been achieved in any model organism, let alone a mouse. Um, so, NeuroPixels gives us access to physiological activity of many simultaneous structures, uh, both cortical and subcortical, with single spike resolution. Uh, given the tremendous value of these recordings, we set out to collect a comprehensive data set that would be generally useful for answering a wide variety of questions about the mouse visual system. So uh, in October 2019, uh, we released the first round of data from these experiments, available for free via the Allen SDK Python package. Uh, first release featured data from 58 recording sessions uh, in which mice passively viewed um, a bunch of different kinds of visual stimuli, including drifting gratings, natural images, and natural movies. Uh, in total, the release included spike trains from nearly 100,000 neurons uh, across a wide variety of brain regions, uh, making it the largest in vivo electrophysiology data set that's currently available. Um, here's a representation of each of those cells mapped to a precise location in the Allen Common Coordinate Framework, uh, colored by brain region. Um, if you're interested in analyzing this data on your own, uh, we recommend checking out the extensive online documentation and tutorials at allensdk.readthedocs.io. Uh, and if you get stuck, please don't hesitate to post an issue on the Allen Brain Map Community Forum. So uh, in this project talk, the, in the first two vignettes, uh, Sev and Tamina will give an overview of some of the methods uh, we've used to collect this immense data set. Um, next, uh, Ram, Shaoshin, and Zach will highlight some of the analyses that have been made possible through our simultaneous recordings across many areas. Um, the, this data set is now starting to be used more widely. Uh, and we're really excited about the scientific discoveries that are gonna come out of it. Um, so those three talks will, will highlight some of the, the work that's being done right now. 
Uh, and then finally, we'll come back to the experiment side. Uh, Corbett and Greg will talk about the work that's currently being done to extend this pipeline to mice performing uh, a visually guided task, uh, which is the same task you heard about uh, yesterday in the visual behavior project talk. So now I will hand it off to Sev for the first vignette. I would like to spend a, a bit of time uh, describing the operations of the pipeline and the sequence of events that takes place. Um, first, uh, on the top right of this slide, you can see the NeuroPixels operation team, and they are dedicated to this pipeline. But we also work uh, tightly with other groups, other teams where um, that do surgery, um, imaging, but also um, behavior. Um, we start by a surgery where uh, we implant a head post and do a craniotomy and a durotomy. And then it's followed by inserting a glass removable cover slip. There is a health check that happens after this procedure. And if everything is okay, the mice go to ISI and the visual areas are mapped. We checked uh, the map for anom uh, anomalies. And if there's none, then the mice can go to the behavior team where they undergo some habituation and some training. Um, when they're done, uh, they are end off again to the um, NeuroPixel team where uh, we uh, do the habituation to the uh, NeuroPixel rigs. Then the mice are ready for the day of experiment and that day starts with a surgery where we do the removal of the cover slip. We implant an insertion uh, window that you can see on the top here with holes for the probes and we stabilize the brain um, with agaros. After a few hours of recovery, um, the re uh, we prepared the experiment by coding the probe with DIAI and we record in six visual areas with six neuropixels probe over one day for passive behavior or two days for active behavior. Um, then the mice are perfused, we recover the brains and we clear them uh, with the iDisco method. Uh, and we image them with the optical projection tomography rig to uh, get the uh, probe location. And now Tamina is going to speak uh, a little bit more in details about that last step. So hi, my name is Tamina, as I've mentioned, and I will briefly walk you through the clearing, imaging, and registration process of our pipeline. So before inserting the probes into the brain, we coat them in dye ICM, which we selected for this process due to its great fluorescent signal retention. And this bottom image here shows the probes dipped in the dye eye. And after recording, the mice undergo a basic mouse cardiac perfusion. Huge shout out to LAS and the other teams and RAs that we work with. Uh, we then clear the brains using the iDisco method, which is a clearing method specialized for large volume immunolabeling and imaging. And this is what the brain looks like after clearing. Okay, cool. And next, the clear brains are imaged using OPT or optical projection tomography. And here you can see the image brain. And in this image, you can see the image brain and the fluorescent probes quite clearly. We then register the brains to a common coordinate framework or CCF brain, which you can see on the top here. And each of these points match up between the two brains and that's how we register them to each other. And after that, we annotate the fluorescent probes. So um, if you look at this image, each color uh, is a different probe and you can just follow the track through the brain to give us those coordinates. Finally, we make sure that the major area boundaries in the OPT volume are aligned with the physiological landmarks in the neuropixels probes. So for example, you always see a drop in the density of recorded neurons in the white matter between cortex and hippocampus. And you can use that knowledge to manually adjust the boundaries uh, so that the physiology and anatomy line up correctly. So this last step and really all of these steps are important so that when we hand this data off for analysis, um, you know, which, which regions the neurons are recorded from, which brings us to the next three presentations. Uh, so uh, they're all gonna be about different data analysis done using this data. And we're gonna start with Ram. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Ram Ayer, uh, and I'll be starting off uh, the analysis talks by talking about uh, some work that we have been doing, looking at the geometry of interaerial interactions. Uh, we have been analyzing this data set to understand the nature of interaerial interactions and communication between visual cortical areas. To that end, we have developed a linear model for single neuron activities in which the firing rate of each neuron is assumed to be a linear combination of the activities of all other simultaneously recorded neurons, uh, the so-called peers, and a stimulus term that has been presented on the screen. Um, we estimate the couplings Wij and Wi beta via least squares with an L1 penalty term. Uh, stimulus information in this model is included via a bank of basis Gabor filters um, where you know, we are considering only static rating stimuli for this presentation. From our model, uh, we can obtain a matrix of couplings Wij uh, from all simultaneously recorded neurons onto all visual cortical neurons, as you can see in this figure here. Uh, such a matrix can be further subdivided to look at the interaction matrices between pairs of visual cortical areas, shown here as an example, looking at just VisP and VisL, obtained from the same matrix that I show you here above. We use this analysis to uh, investigate how distinct are the subspace interactions from a source region like VisP to different target regions like VisL and VisAL. To answer this, we compute the subspace angle between the singular vectors of the VisP VisL matrix and a low dimensional subspace spanned by the first n, in this case 10 singular vectors of the VisP VisAL matrix. Our analysis shows that the first few singular vectors of the VisP VisL interaction subspace are closely aligned with the VisP VisAL subspace. And this angle mostly monotonically increases for the higher dimensions. I show you here one example of VisP to VisL and VisAL, but uh, our analysis shows that the result generally holds true for other pairs of visual cortical areas. So this then implies that distinct subspaces of the source region uh, mediate interactions with different target regions as shown in this schematic cartoon here, uh, where you have a subspace of the VisP uh, mediating interactions with VisL and another subspace that mediates interactions with VisAL. We are working to determine if the first few dimensions here uh, can be thought of as communicating more global or general information, while the higher dimensions can be thought of as communicating more specific information about the environment and the external stimulus. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Shashwan. Thanks. Using the NeuroPixels passive viewing data set, we find functional hierarchy in the mouse visual areas and the separated feed forward and recurrent modules in the, visual, in the visual network. I'll give you a brief summary of the uh, findings, but to learn more, you can, all these results are uh, available online. With multi-area simultaneous recordings across multiple visual areas, we can ask how is visual information propagated among these areas. Chris Weir's anatomical tracing experiment revealed a hierarchical organization of the mouse visual areas. However, the functional relevance of this architecture is still lacking. We find enlarging receptive field size, increasing response latency, and increasing receptive field complexity along this anatomically identified hierarchy, suggesting the existence of a functional hierarchy which is consistent with the anatomical one. We further quantified the direction of functional connections between pairs of neurons based on their relative uh, spike timing using cross cardiograms. The directionality of functional connections between areas established a functional connectivity map of the visual areas simultaneously recorded. This functional connectivity map 
nicely correlate with the one extracted from anatomical connections, directly suggesting the signal flow during sensory drive follows the anatomically defined hierarchy. With a simple network simulation, we found to obtain a functional connectivity map like the one we see in the data, the network has to have a hierarchical and recurrent structure. However, tracking information flow in the recurrent network is not straightforward. So we used network analysis and separated the network into three different modules. The first module is dominated by weak connections. The second module is mostly driving the network activity. And the, the last module mostly driven by the network activity. This way we can separate apart the feed forward and the recurrent process in the individual network in mouse. Now I'll hand over to Zach and uh, he will talk about inter-area communication with local field potentials. Hi, so in this project, we analyzed LFP data in order to identify detailed functional connectivity networks across areas and how they depended on the, function, uh, the frequency bands that were carrying information. We leveraged LFP recordings from uh, sessions where the mouse was viewing uh, wide field drifting gratings, as well as the common coordinate frame localization of neuropixel channels uh, within layers and areas. Taking the data, we screened LFP trials for stationarity in order that we could perform a spectral grain drift causality analysis as a starting point for our functional uh, connectivity characterization. The maps that we got from one area to another were then thresholded in order to identify regions of the strongest grain drift causality and how these depended on the particular frequency bands, every 10 from zero to 40 Hertz and every 20 from 40 to 100 Hertz re represented low and high frequencies. Then grouping these by their common coordinate frame, the, the channels were associated with uh, each specific joint layer pair and that comprised the projection patterns that represented each frequency band session and directional area pair that we analyzed. We then carried out a series of secondary analyses whose code is bundled into a GitHub repository that will be released in, uh, along with a forthcoming preprint very soon. To discuss some of the secondary analyses, we, we first uh, by eye just studied the functional connectivity maps that we got on average from one layer to another and noticed an abrupt change in functional connectivity patterns when moving from low to high frequency uh, bands for several of the directional area pairs. To do this more systematically, we took these uh, functional projection patterns and uh, grouped them uh, by, uh, by, by a clustering algorithm and identified the different cluster identity breakdowns within uh, particular frequency bands and anatomical hierarchy directions. We found that uh, feed forward projections at low frequency bands tended to strongly represent deep to shallow projections. And at uh, feed, anatomically feedback projection patterns uh, overrepresented deep to deep uh, functional projections. Uh, whereas at high frequency bands, there was uh, much less difference between anatomically feedback and feed forward. We also found statistically significant changes in the layer to layer projections originating from uh, uh, as decreases in those originated from it, intermediate layers and increases in, uh, in projections from shallow and deep layers. Lastly, using anatomical tracing data from the harris mihala study from 2019, we found that anatomical connectivity much more strongly defined functional connectivity at low frequency bands. I'll now turn it over to Corbett, who will discuss some behavioral analyses. Okay, so the analysis you've been hearing about took advantage of our passive viewing data. 
We're very excited to be launching this year a new pipeline, the NeuroPixels and Behavior Pipeline. So here we're going to take advantage of the same technology that Josh described to record from six visual cortical areas simultaneously, but now while the mouse performs a visual change detection task. This is the same task that you heard described in detail yesterday by the OFIS team, but briefly we present a series of natural images to the mouse and the mouse learns to lick when the identity of the image changes. So that would be for this blue box stimulus in uh, this series. So recording during this task um, really yields a rich data set. You can see here for just a single trial of the change action task, a spike raster for 700 units recorded simultaneously. And you can see that they span not only those six visual cortical areas that we explicitly targeted, but also subcortical areas in the hippocampus and spiculum and subcortical visual areas like the superior colliculus in this experiment, but in other experiments, uh, visual thalamic regions like LGN and LP. So I really think this data set will give us a unique opportunity to look at how activity propagates through the visual hierarchy uh, in the context of active vision. Um, in designing the experimental design, it was really important for us to preserve some of the key features of the OFIS task um, that you heard about earlier. And in particular, um, we wanted to preserve the familiar versus novel image set comparison and also active versus passive viewing context. And we really think that these two pipelines would be highly complementary. So to look at familiar versus novel images, we train the mouse on one image set, image set A, and these are the only eight images that the mouse sees during training. And then our first recording day, we use that same image set. But now in breaking from the visual coding pipeline a little bit, we've tacked on a second recording day, the very next day. And in this recording session, we show a novel image set, image set B. Six of those images the mouse has never encountered before, but two we preserve from image set A. So those are shared images across the two sets. And that provides a nice control for us for image novelty. To look at active versus passive viewing contexts, for each recording session, we split it up into three parts. The first hour, the mouse is performing the change detection task. We follow that with a short receptive field mapping stimulus. And then finally, we close with an hour of passive viewing in which we present the exact same image stack of the mouse encountered during the change detection task, but now with the lick port retracted. So that gives us an opportunity to see how uh, visual responses differ for the same stimuli in these two very different behavioral contexts. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a sense of the overall structure of uh, this new pipeline. We're collecting data right now and we'll continue into the new year a little bit. Uh, we plan on recording from at least 24 mice um, spread across three genotypes, control mice, excuse me, wild type mice, uh, and then a VIP and SST crossed to the AI32 channel Rhodopsin line. That gives us the opportunity to identify interneuron subtypes based on their response to uh, laser pulse, which you can see on the right here. We've identified five to 10 uh, somatostatin, putative somatostatin cells that are robustly activated by this uh, laser ramp. And if you do a back of the envelope calculation, we estimate that we'll record from about 40,000 units in total. So we think this is a really exciting data set and will be uh, very valuable to the community. Um, adapting the pipeline to the behavior definitely posed some challenges. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Greg, who's gonna talk about some of the optimization we did to improve our success rate. All right, I'm gonna go through some of the biggest improvements we've made since we launched the visual coding pipeline nearly two years ago. Um, one of the things we've been working on is our experiment yield or our efficiency, the number of cells that we can record in each mouse. Um, we've improved this by increasing our insertion depth, by uh, making sure that we can always insert all six of our probes, and by, as Corbett mentioned, increasing the number of experiment days. So in total, this has nearly tripled the amount of usable data we can get from each mouse. Um, one thing that's very important in these experiments is that the brain is healthy and stable and clearly visible during the recording. Uh, some of the changes we made both to increase our insertion depth and the second recording day uh, made this a much more difficult task. So early in the behavior piloting, we saw examples of, of bruising. Um, sometimes the agarose would become cloudy and the brain surface would not be clearly visible. And sometimes we would observe bleeding or hematoma that became more severe overnight. 
these issues were particularly prevalent on the second recording day. And we've now improved some of our methods so that we can have uh, beautiful brains even on the second recording day. Another thing that's very important in these experiments is to be recording from cells that are uh, responding to the center of the screen. Um, this reduces edge effects and it also increases the likelihood that different areas will be functionally connected. So for a visual coding data set, you can see that some of the areas tend to cluster near the edges of the screen. Uh, for our behavior pipeline, we've been able to remedy this. So a much higher percentage of the cells we record from are responding to the center of the screen. And here's an example mouse from a recent experiment where all six areas on both days show good aggregate receptive fields that are responding to that uh, central portion of the screen. Lastly, these are incredibly difficult experiments already and adding an active behavior component and also the second uh, experiment day with a new stimulus uh, makes them even more difficult. Um, we put in a huge amount of effort to make sure that we can uh, reduce any possible failure modes that we know about and I'm happy to say that our success rate for experiments has been maintained since visual coding or, or perhaps even increased a little bit. Um, and lastly, I'd like to, to mention that all these improvements are being employed in our visual behavior pipeline right now. We're currently doing data collection and that will extend into quarter one of next year and uh, subsequent packaging and data release later in 2021. We'd like to thank the teams that we work most closely with, closely with uh, technology team, MPE, and also LAS and NSB, and uh, the visual behavior team that came before us for the task. And we would also like to thank our founder, Paul Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. Thank you. Great, thanks to the uh, NeuroPixels team. Uh, as a reminder, we won't be doing live Q&A for the project talks, um, but if you wanna submit a question uh, for the team in the community forum, there should be a link to that in the chat. Um, our next speaker is uh, Clinton Cave, one of our 2020 Next Generation Leaders. Clint is an assistant professor of neuroscience at Middlebury College. <clears throat> he holds a BA in psychology from Yale and completed his PhD in neuroscience and did his postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins in the lab of Shanithi Sakathan. Clint's doctoral work expanded the known roles of a small family of cell surface enzymes, the six transmembrane GDE proteins. These proteins are unique in their ability to enzymatically sever the lipid anchor of GPI anchor proteins on the cell surface. Uh, during embryonic neurogenesis, the signaling axis is critical for the successful differentiation of spinal and cortical neurons. Using functional uh, genetic approaches in mice, Clinton's work demonstrated that GDE2 also plays a crucial role for neuronal survival in the postnatal nervous system. These efforts uh, heralded a new line of research investigating how GDE2 uh, dysfunction integrates into neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, ALS. Clint began his professorship at Middlebury in the fall of 2018. Uh, he also teaches courses on cellular and molecular neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, and neurodevelopment, as well as the history of neuroscience. He runs a research lab with undergraduate students examining the, these molecular mechanisms, regulating progenitor patterning, neurogenesis, and cell fate decisions in the vertebrate neural tube through the lens of GDE GPI signaling. His talk today is titled GDE Signaling and Development and Disease. Welcome to Clint and take it away. All right, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and to, uh, to be on the Next Generation Leaders Council and really looking forward to interacting with more people um, as this uh, great opportunity moves forward. Uh, what I wanted to do today was to give you kind of an overview of my time uh, as a graduate student and postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins looking at these GDE proteins, and then to give you a, a sense of what my lab is doing uh, moving forward into the future. So we're interested in the cellular and molecular mechanisms that are governing spinal cord development. And uh, let me give you a quick review of how the uh, nervous system develops in the spinal cord. 
The nervous system is an ectodermal derivative, and it originally develops from a tube structure called the neural tube. That's illustrated here. And this neural tube is filled with progenitors. These are the cycling cells that are eventually going to give rise to all of the post-mitotic cell types in the nervous system. They're going to make neurons, and then they're going to make glia. And within this uh, tube structure, there's a, a lumen, which has the ventricle. So there's a ventricular zone that's closest to the lumen, an intermediate zone, and then a mantle zone. And initially, these progenitors are cycling, and they're just trying to make more of themselves, right? We need a lot of progenitors in order to uh, create the full nervous system. But they have a problem, right? The nervous system is quite diverse in the cell types. Where are these cells located? Um, the dorsal cells versus ventral cells, rostral versus caudal cells. So there needs to be a system in order to give these progenitors instructions that says, well, I'm gonna make this type of neuron. Why don't you make this type of neuron? And this third cell, well, maybe they'll make a third type of neuron. And this process of, of, of specification is called progenitor patterning. And how does the uh, embryonic nervous system accomplish this? Well, they use morphogens. These are proteins that are secreted from specific organizing centers. Uh, for example, uh, BMP, bone morphogenetic protein, retinoic acid, and sonic hedgehog, and they're secreted in gradients. So for example, BMP is released dorsally uh, from a structure called the roof plate in the neural tube. And what that does is that creates a gradient where if you were a progenitor, that was really close to the top of the neural tube, you have a lot of BMP signaling. But if you were a progenitor down here, that was really close to the ventral side of the neural tube, you wouldn't have as much. Uh, other uh, morphogens are used at the same time. So for example, sonic hedgehog has been shown to be released from the floor plate, and that creates a gradient of signaling in the opposite direction. And there are also morphogens that are released outside of the neural tube. So for example, the developing somite which is a, uh, the a mesodermal structure, it's releasing retinoic acid that can also uh, influencing, that will also influence the patterning of these progenitors. And what's the consequence of this? This creates a 3D positional system wherein this progenitor has a unique combination of morphogens that will then cause it to express transcription factors that will pattern this ventricular zone into discrete progenitor domains. And there's a mechanism of cross repression that then goes on to sharpen these individual boundaries. And this is really useful because with this patterning in place, now these cells have instructions in order to create the uh, post mitotic cell types in that will migrate from the ventricular zone out to the mantle zone. And this um, variety is seen, for example, in dorsal neuronal structures or dorsal neuronal cell types that will then project uh, um, rostrally into the um, um, rostral central nervous system, for example, thalamic relay neurons versus uh, ventral cell types, for example, motor neurons that will then project out to the muscle and, in, and interneuronal cell types as well. And um, when my uh, graduate advisor, uh, Shanthini Sakanathan, when she was starting her lab, she was very interested in one of these cell types, the generation of um, somatic motor neurons in the spinal cord. And it turns out that retinoic acid is doubly important for these cell types because the um, presence of retinoic acid is necessary for these PMN progenitors to generate motor neurons. And so the, the, one of the biggest questions was, what, is the, what types of genes are necessary in order to promote this um, pattern of differentiation? And there's subtra a subtraction screen was done, which compared this ventral neural tube in the presence and absence of retinoic acid to see what kinds of genes were affected by this specific morphogen. And one of the genes that was uh, significantly enriched in the presence of retinoic acid was this gene GDE2. And so GD2 is glycerophosphodiester phosphodiesterase 2. And I've schematized the protein topology here. It's a six transmembrane protein that has intracellular and in C termini and an extracellular enzymatic domain, um, a GDPD domain. And this is a protein that's expressed on the cell surface. And again, is enriched um, in, in the presence of retinoic acid or its expression is increased by the presence of retinoic acid. So where in that neural tube can we find GDE protein? So this was an expression study that was done uh, very early on looking at um, where we would find this protein. And it turns out that GDE, so this is an immunohistochemistry looking at the one side of the ventral neural tube. Here's the uh, progenitor domain medially and the mantle domain uh, laterally. 
And we can see you can use different markers to label progenitor populations versus post mitotic neuronal populations to see where in that developmental process GDE2 is expressed. In terms of that GD2 is expressed in the motor neuron populations that have migrated laterally away from the ventricle. And you can see the co-localization with islet 1-2, which is a marker of motor neuron populations, and it's excluded from oleg 2 which is a transcription factor that labels progenitor populations. So as the um, motor neurons differentiate, they start to express uh, GD2. And uh, the next step was to try to figure out a functional role for these proteins. And I want to introduce the, the model system here of the developing chick neural tube. And this is a longstanding model of vertebrate neurodevelopment. And it's very useful because you can open up a fertilized chicken egg and you can see the embryo developing on top. So this is the head of the embryo, this is the tail of the embryo. And you can inject constructs uh, that will either increase gene expression or decrease gene expression into that lumen of the neural tube. And we can pass an electric current across uh, the embryo. We can electroprate the embryo and that will move that construct uh, unilaterally into one side of the embryo. So we can have an electroprated side on one side and a control side on the other. And this really allows you to have a nice internal control for the um, functional consequences of changing, changing gene expression on one side. So if we knock down GDE2 on one side of the developing vertebrate neural tube, what are the functional consequences? So we can see here uh, GFP labeling the electroporated side. This is again a transverse section of the neural tube as illustrated here. And if we look for uh, GDE2 um, signal, it's decreased on the electroporated side as we would expect. This is the RNA of GDE2. Uh, and uh, we can look at the um, expression of islet 1-2, which marks motor neurons. And again, on that electroporated side, we see a reduction in the number of postmitotic motor neurons, which suggests that GDE2 is necessary for their differentiation. What if we go the other direction, right? Instead of reducing GDE2, why don't we increase GDE2? So moving from a loss of function approach to a gain of function approach. Now I'm zooming in even further on the ventral midline, um, which is illustrated by this arrow. The ventricular zone is illustrated by this, um, this double-sided arrow. And we can look for um, the expression of islet 2 labeling motor neurons and GFP showing our electroporated side. And here's our empty vector control. And what we can see is that the nice restriction of motor neurons to the lateral neural tube. But if you start to overexpress GDE2, now we see this um, inc uh, ectopic expression of islet 2 close to the midline. So we're causing this precocious differentiation of motor neurons. And if we mutate uh, a, a amino acid residue within this enzymatic domain, what we call a GDE2 APL mutant, we actually see that this um, effect on differentiation is prevented. So that suggests that this enzymatic domain, this portion of the protein that's facing extracellularly is really important for this process of differentiation. And we can also do another control looking at GDE1, which is a two pass family member that doesn't uh, regulate this um, process. So we know that this process is specific for GDE2. Um, this is all in the avian system. So it was, um, and the, there's a lot that we can learn with that system and I continue to use it in my lab, but the lab um, also wanted to know, is this a feature of mammalian neurodevelopment as well? So GDE2, there is an orthologous gene, GDE2 expressed in the um, mouse neural tube. So we're looking again at the development of the neural tube and looking at the expression of GDE2. So at e embryonic day 9.5 and embryonic day 10.5, we can see GD2 expression laterally in the area that would have the post-mitotic neurons. And when we're now in uh, a murine system, we can take advantage of the genetic approaches and the lab created a GDE2 knockout mouse. So now here's a constitutive knockout that's missing that protein um, um, throughout the life of the animal. And what we see embryonically, this is also at day 9.5. When we look at those same markers, oleg 2 labeling progenitors, islet 1, 2, and HB9 labeling motor neurons, the absence of GDE2 is also, um, also causes the reduction in the differentiation of motor neuron numbers. 
So, and, and this reduction comes without changes in the progenitor numbers or changes in cell death, suggesting that there's this conserved function of GDE2 in promoting motor neuron differentiation. So how does, it, how does it do that, right? What is this protein doing? It's on the surface, it has this enzymatic domain, and it turns out that GD2 has this um, really unique function of being able to regulate GPI-anchored proteins on the cell surface. So GPI anchors, glycosyl, phosphatidyl, and inositol anchors, are a post-translational uh, modification that can tether proteins to the extracellular leaflet of the plasma membrane with this lipid anchor. And GDE2, um, is seen here, it can actually use this enzymatic domain to sever this GPI anchor, which would release uh, this GPI anchor protein or shed it from the cell surface. And so that we, we think this is a really interesting pathway because you could envision that whatever that GPI anchored substrate is doing on the cell surface, uh, its cleavage or removal would prevent or reduce that function, right? Causing cell autonomous changes. We could envision it the other way. Well, this now allows us to use the, the plethora of GPI anchor proteins that are on the cell surface. If they're released into the extracellular matrix, right, that can cause a non-cell autonomous change and they can almost function like neuropeptides. So how do we measure this? So the, um, the first thing that we wanted to do was to look at the um, expression or the, the, the release mechanisms and go over a, you can use a method here to measure this. And so this method is a hex cell assay. So we wanted to create an in vitro method to measure this. And what we do is we use um, hex cells and we can co-transfect them with a GPI anchored substrate. And this one that I'm illustrating here is REC, a GPI anchored protein. And all the cells will express REC, but in different conditions, they can express an empty vector, GDE2, or the GDE2 APML mutant, or that two-pass transmembrane family member GDE1. And then we can measure how much of the protein is found in the media versus how much is found in the lysate. And of course, all the proteins have uh, significant amounts of REC in the lysate. This is an overexpression system, but only upon expressing GDE2, right, with a functional GDPD domain, with a functional enzymatic domain, do we see this uh, significant release into the media. Right, suggesting that this uh, GD2 can shed GPI anchor proteins from the media. So we've been able to adapt this um, to look at a variety of GPI anchored substrates uh, and they show a similar release pattern. So how does uh, REC, for example, relate to that mechanism of neuronal differentiation? Right? What is REC doing as a GPI anchored substrate of GD2 uh, to regulate this developmental process? So um, we turn to a process of juxtacrine signaling, um, which is the canonical notch pathway. So the notch signaling is a pair uh, of, uh, is a protein intercellular signaling pathway that depends on cells being um, next to each other because both the ligand from the signal sending cell and the receptor from the signal, signal receiving cell are transmembrane proteins. So the ligand delta um, signals to the receptor notch and notch activation will um, ensure that this cell stays in the progenitor um, type. In other words, it prevents its differentiation into motor neurons. And upstream of DLL1 is a family, uh, atom family metalloprotease, atom 10. And atom 10 actually has the ability to cleave delta. But in um, initial conditions, atom 10 is inhibited by the surface expression of GPI anchored REC. Uh, but as neurons differentiate, right, early born neurons, they'll differentiate, they'll express GDE2. What that does is cleave REC, right? Now you've removed REC from the surface, you've disinhibited ADAM10, and now you've, um, ADAM10 can proceed to cleave delta, right? So this is a signaling cascade that happens on the surface of differentiating neurons. The consequence is a, a non-cell autonomous effect on these ventricular zone progenitors wherein they've lost the ability to um, activate the notch receptor and that promotes neurogenesis. So this uh, mechanism also explains why um, GDE2 loss of function, they didn't result in the global loss of motor neurons, but only subsets uh, of motor neurons and also some populations of inner neurons as well. So um, this was around the time that I joined the lab and, and my question was, you know, what is the role of GDE2 
after development, right? A lot of this really beautiful characterization and mechanistic work was addressing, you know, embryonic functions of GDE2. Um, but what we noticed is that GDE2, it continues to be expressed in the postnatal animal. So I'm showing you a, a fluorescent in C2 hybridization, looking at GDE2 expression and in a one month um, lumbar spinal cord. And we can see uh, now how much that uh, early neural tube has expanded into the adult morphology, where we can have a central gray matter, which houses the uh, neuronal cell bodies. We can divide that into the uh, stereotypic spinal cord laminae and the uh, white matter, which has axon, axon tracts and glial cell bodies. And zooming in, we can see that GDE2 continues to be expressed in uh, neuronal and non-neuronal populations at the mRNA level. And we can also um, make lysates from um, eight week and also all the way out to 24 month uh, old animals and to see that GDE2 protein expression continues uh, to be, um, GDE2 continues to be expressed. So uh, it's there, right? Is it doing anything? As we were aging these uh, GD2 knockout animals, we noticed a unique phenotype. So in wild type animals, if you elevate them by the tail, they will splay out their rear legs. Um, but what we saw in the GD2 knockout was this phenotype of hind limb, clas hind limb clasping, which is indicative of peripheral weakness and uh, a marker of neurodegeneration. And um, while the animals didn't have a truncated lifespan, right, this is all the way out to 13 months, this led us to this hypothesis that GDE2, right, a developmental protein, might have additional roles later on. Right? And this is an interesting theme you know, that I want to continue in my own research. How do developmental proteins readapt and acquire new roles in the postnatal environment? So our hypothesis was that GDE2 is required for neuronal survival in the postnatal animal. So how did we uh, go about investigating this? And um, we turn to uh, examples from the literature to think about what types of phenotypes are associated with degeneration, because we came at this from a unique perspective, right? We didn't come at it from the, from the human population or the human mutation approach, right? We had a foundational approach, a basic science approach that said, we found an, a signaling axis that might be important in degeneration. What sorts of phenotypes might we screen this GD2 knockout for? So looking to examples from human neurodegeneration, um, these are several examples of um, degenerative phenotypes that are seen across several different degenerative contexts. For example, this is uh, spongiform vacuolization, these abscesses that form. This is the white matter of a patient with uh, multiple sclerosis. Here's an example of gliosis, the morphology of reactive microglia in a patient uh, that's suffering from, uh, that suffered from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. ALS is also associated with cytoskeletal defects. So as the neurons degenerate, they lose the ability to regulate cytoskeletal pro proteins. As degeneration progresses, um, we have the cell death of specific populations. So for, here's an example of a spinal motor neuron, which selectively uh, degenerates in ALS. As neurons degenerate, we have the loss of peripheral phys physiology, nerve conduction, motor unit organization diminishes, and uh, the ultimate consequence of this is impaired motor performance in, in terms of spinal degeneration. And depending on where the degeneration is, there's also the, um, co the uh, cognitive defects, cognitive um, reductions as well. So what we wanted to do was to see, you know, in our model of degeneration, do we see uh, these features? And um, this was a really exciting time because we, the, you know, this was a brand new direction for the lab, right? The lab to this point had been really just looking at uh, embryology effects. And so to do this postnatally, I really want to thank, you know, collaborators within the clinical uh, Hopkins um, clinical neuroscience community and uh, investigators outside of Hopkins because I spent the better part of my graduate career really developing these methodologies and bringing systems online in order to uh, test the pathology and test the physiology and behavior of these animals. And um, what did we find? And so it turns out um, that um, there are uh, correlates of all these features in the GDE2 knockout mouse. So we have uh, vacuolization of neurons in the GD2 knockout. We have gliosis. This is a reactive microglia. There are cytoskeletal defects. We see the loss of uh, alpha and gamma motor neurons in the spinal cord. 
as those motor neurons die, we see reorganization of peripheral motor units. And also, as I already alluded to, uh, behavioral deficits in grip strength and fine motor function. And um, this was really exciting because, you know, it was a great example of going where the science takes you, right? And, and I liked it. That was probably one of the most important lessons that I learned as a graduate student is not to be afraid to, to really figure out what's going on, even if it's sort of outside your wheelhouse. And um, this was exciting because it, it showed us that there's this slow progressive degeneration in the absence of GDE2 um, in the GDE2 knockout mouse. So our next question um, was to think about whether or not the, um, this signaling axis might be disrupted in other examples of neurodegeneration. Right? So we wanted to look at another model of degeneration. And this was the uh, transgenic copper zinc uh, superoxide dismutase one, the SOD mouse model of degeneration. So SOD is an enzyme responsible for processing um, superoxide into molecular oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. And mutations in SOD one have been identified in cases of familial uh, ALS. And uh, one of these mutations, um, G93A, Transgenic mice, uh, they exhibit vacuolization, motor neuron death, paralysis, and a truncated lifespan. So here are a couple of examples of the vacuolization and astrogliosis that are seen in the aged uh, SOD mouse. And the SOD is a much more severe form of degeneration than we saw um, that than we see in the GDE2 knockout mouse. But we wanted to see whether or not GP, you know, GPI anchor regulation could that be a feature of degenerative diseases? And uh, how do we, right? So I wanna introduce another assay to think about uh, the mechanisms involved in that. And this assay is um, sequential solubilization. So we wanted to know whether or not the um, release of a GPA anchor protein, could we measure that? And we, um, we know that the cleavage of that GPA anchor protein will alter the hydrophobicity of the GPI anchor protein. With the anchor intact, right, the um, GPI anchor protein will want to stay uh, close to, you know, in membrane fractions. But after that cleavage, right, after you remove the hydrocarbons that are actually tethering it into the membrane, well, it's much more hydrophilic. So you can take tissue and uh, homogenize it in a buffer and in a TRIS buffer. And what you'll be getting is the, um, you'll move into solution all the hydrophilic non-membrane proteins, and we're calling this an S1 fraction. And we can pellet the rest uh, of the tissue. Then we can use a specific detergent, in this case, um, octoglucoside, and this detergent can um, solubilize membranes much more efficiently. And it's actually been shown to uh, solubilize uh, some of the microdomains that house GPI anchor protein. So that's why we chose it. And now we can have a tissue that has the hydrophobic membrane proteins. And so if there was a deficit in GPA anchored release in this disease condition, right, we would be able to see it, uh, especially in this S1 fraction. So to test these fractions, right, we can look for proteins that should partition accordingly, right? For example, the sodium potassium ATPase, that's a transmembrane protein. So we should see enrichment in the S2 fraction compared to the S1 fraction. GAP-DH is a cytosolic protein, so it should be more in S1 than S2. And that's what we see. So this is not a complete isolation, but it is an enrichment uh, that would give us some sensitivity to see if there are differential uh, GPA anchor release. So using this method, you know, if we return to the SOD animal, we wanted to look at the cleavage um, of a family of GPA anchor proteins, the glipocans. So glipocan six and four have already been established as GDE2 substrates. So can we see uh, differential activity of uh, the partitioning of these proteins in the SOD animal? And this is looking specifically at the S1 fraction. And what we can see in the wild types are um, a baseline level of GPA anchor release, but in the SOD condition, we see that that is uh, significantly reduced in glipocan 6, 4, and also another family member, glipocan 1, that we tested normalized to GAP-DH and that's quantified here. So this was really exciting because you know, it suggested that um, the partitioning of GPI anchors right, and the regulation of GPI anchors that you know, prior to this research, you know, it had been an underappreciated component of neurodegenerative disease. 
So I want to stop and um, sort of refocus us a little bit. Right? I've showed you an example of how uh, GDE2 um, can be used in motor neuron differentiation and how that protein continues to be used in motor neuron um, to promote motor neuron survival, essentially. But GD2 is not alone in the six transmembrane um, GPI anchor cleaving GDEs. Turns out that there's also GDE3 and GDE6. And what's interesting about this family, um, this um, protein family, is that they have different cell type expressions. So for example, GDE2 is found on neurons and oligodendrocytes and microglia. GDE3 is on oligodendrocyte precursor cells and astrocytes, and GDE6 is on radioglia. So if we want to stop and think about why this protein family and why the signaling axis is interesting, you know, you could envision a system wherein different cell types have different complements of GPI anchor proteins expressed on them, as well as different uh, G GDE proteins that are regulating them. So we're, what we're trying to uncover is potentially a signaling code that would allow cells to proceed through different developmental checkpoints and different postnatal survival checkpoints, depending on the regulation of their cognate GPI anchored proteins. So we've already seen one story with REC. Uh, in another context, um, neuroblastoma differentiation has been uh, shown to be regulated by glipican 6 in GDE2. GDE3 can regulate the proliferation of OPCs um, by, by regulation of CNTFR, ciliary neurotrophic receptor. And um, this, you know, another reason why we think this system is interesting or this signaling axis is compelling is because it, it would allow for a lot of dynamic changes that are independent of translation and transcription. So for example, if you were to survey that um, SOD mouse for glipican RNA levels and, and bulk glipican protein levels, you might not see any changes, but the system could use rapid um, cleavage by the GDEs to change signaling and proceed through specific checkpoints, for example. Um, the other thing that I am interested in is the role of GDE6 and differential activity of GDE proteins could also help create gradients uh, for protein expression. And that is a, a really useful tool when thinking about the roles of GD6 going back to development. So in my lab, um, I've returned to development and thinking about how we can use GD6 to understand that earlier process of progenitor patterning. So uh, to wrap up, I want to share some um, early results that are coming out of my lab and kind of our future directions. So going back to the expression pattern, right, GDE6 actually has a complementary expression pattern with GDE2. We saw GDE2 in the lateral spinal cord in those differentiating motor neurons, but we see GDE6 more medially uh, in the ventricular zone um, at stage 19 and stage 27. These are developmental stages in the chick neural tube. So uh, the question, can we use those same functional studies to understand what's happening with GDE6? And yes, we can. That's what we're doing right now. So GDE6 gain of function studies where I can electroporate GDE6 on one side of the embryo. Uh, some of our preliminary data is shown here. So on all of these panels, the right side is um, overexpressing GDE6. And we're looking at an early patterning stage, stage 19. And we can see um, the different markers for different progenitor domains. FOX2A uh, marks the floor plate, NKX2.2 marks P3, OLG2, as we saw earlier, marks PM, uh, the motor neuron progenitor domain, PMN. And um, ordinarily, you'd want both halves of the spinal cord to be uh, nicely aligned. But what we're seeing with GDE6 overexpression is actually this shift in the extent and sizes of these progenitor domains, which I've bracketed on the electroporated side versus the control side. So for example, NKX2.2 is shifted dorsally uh, as is OLIG2. And we also see this, these examples of ectopic um, um, cell types that are expressing those progenitor markers, but they're outside of the normal domain. And so something is happening in terms of GDE6 and a potential GPI anchored substrate that is regulating this process of, of dorsal ventral patterning. And you know, as a consequence of that, you know, are there effects on other dorsal patterning domains? Are there changes in neuronal production uh, after neurogenesis? Are there changes in glial specification, glial production? Uh, those are kind of the, some of the long-term interests of the lab. I'll also point out uh, these markers down here for sonic hedgehog, the ventral morphogen itself, 
as well as patched one, which is the um, receptor for sonic hedgehog. So the presence of the ligand and the absence of the receptor is actually a marker for the floor plate itself. So we have this expansion, this ventralization uh, in the floor plate on the electroparade side with the gain of function. So students in my lab right now are pursuing the characterization of these uh, gain of function experiments and, uh, and we're also uh, designing complementary loss of function experiments. But I want to, uh, so this is one half of what my lab um, is working on right now. And I want to transition to a, a third methodology to ask uh, kind of what I think is the most interesting question. Well, what's the GPI anchor protein that could be involved here? And how do we um, find more GPI anchored substrates, right? How do we figure out that code of which GDE proteins are talking to which GPI anchored proteins? So the, the, the last assay that I want to talk about is something that uh, we ca we're calling an alpha toxin assay. And this is a method to help us enrich for GP anchor proteins that are released. So you can take, um, you can do this in uh, hex cells again, or any cell type that you're interested in. Uh, we're doing it right now in chick neural tube explants. So I can take the neural tube out of the egg and culture it, and I can do a manipulation. So for example, I can look at a GD6 wildtype or I can knock down uh, GD6 expression. And we're interested in which proteins, which GP anchor proteins, I've labeled different colors as uh, example proteins, are regulated by GD6 in the early neural tube. So the wild type would release uh, a subset of proteins. Let's imagine that this red and green protein are regulated by GD6. So the wild type would have their release into the media, but the GD6 shRNA, which has a lower protein expression, would have decreased release. But in addition to proteins, right, there's all sorts of uh, factors that are being released into the media. We wanted to have a way to enrich for GPI anchor proteins. So GPI anchor proteins are, um, they still have the anchor attached. So we can actually use alpha toxin, which is a toxin that's created by uh, Clostridium septicum. That's an anaerobic bacterium. And what that does is to, um, it, the way that bacterium kills cells is by binding to GPI anchors. So we can use recombinant alpha toxin in order to bind the GPI anchor proteins that we find in the media and enrich them. And then we can run these uh, proteins through gel electrophoresis, comparing um, the knockdown versus the control. And bands that are weaker in the knockdown, right? Those would be the bands we would take out in the wild type and look for mass spec identification, right? And, and um, we know this process works because we've already used it in the wild type and GD2 knockout and it identifies the glipicans, for example. So um, this screen will be uh, sort of uh, coming, coming online uh, early next year. So we're hoping to um, really help to figure out which proteins to focus on. So um, today what I showed you is uh, a story about the role of GDE2 in the differentiation and survival of postnatal uh, motor neurons. And uh, what I also want you to take away are the different ways that we are using um, in vitro methodology to figure out which proteins are being released. The hex cell assay, the sequential solubilization, and the alpha toxin assay. Those are all uh, ongoing experiments uh, in my lab. And then the, the most important thing that I hope you can take away is really the versatility of this signaling axis, right? How different GDE proteins and their cognate GPI anchors really have the ability to affect a broad variety of signaling, right? There's over 300 uh, known GPI anchored proteins expressed um, across the body. And um, we think that this is a really unique way for those proteins to be regulated in different developmental and postnatal and disease contexts as well. So I want to finish by um, giving a, a, as big an acknowledgement as I can to my graduate men mentor, uh, Shan Sakanathan, and all of the members uh, of the Sakanathan lab, some, uh, many here, past and present, uh, as well as other collaborators uh, at Hopkins that really helped us launch this neurodegeneration wing of the lab. Uh, I also want to thank uh, funding sources from when um, I was at Hopkins, the NINDS and the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association. In my lab at Middlebury College, I want to thank uh, the students that have worked and are working uh, on this research, as well as my current extramural funding from the National Science Foundation, as well as the Vermont Biomedical Research Network. And I really want to highlight this funding mechanism. It's an INBRI grant from IGMS that helps promote uh, research in states like Vermont that are underfunded um, by NIH.
And uh, really that's, uh, that allows us to provide these sort of core mentoring and, and educational experiences working with undergrads. Uh, so with that, I'll leave you with a picture of a, a bucolic picturesque Vermont, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Clint. Uh, super interesting. Uh, we've got a first question here from uh, Forrest. Uh, he says, hi, Clint. Thanks for the great talk. Do you think these GDE uh, degeneration effects are mostly cell autonomous or are there non-cell autonomous components? Um, and then a follow-up, if the latter, can you elaborate on the potential non-cell autonomous mechanisms that might be at play? Yeah, most definitely. And I think the, you know, the, the idea of GPI anchor regulation, as I mentioned, both, both are possible. The, in adulthood, um, GD2 specifically, we know that it's expressed in um, glial cell types, uh, for example, uh, oligodendrocytes. And um, some work that's continuing on at Hopkins is using cell, sp cell type specific deletions of GDE2 uh, in order to, to, type, uh, to address that question. So I think um, both, both are possible. I, I imagine that um, there would be numerous act, you know, ways for non-cell autonomous signaling to occur, particularly through mechanisms of glial support for neural survival. Excellent. Uh, we've got another question here from uh, Peter Burbach. Uh, great talk. Thank you. I wonder if there is substrate specificity in the GDEs and how this may affect the biology. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and that that's certainly an ongoing topic. There are a lot of different ways that we could envision substrate specificity, and it is an important question because your cell is coded with all these. You know, ten to twenty percent of the cellular protein that's on the surface of cells um, is GPI anchored. So we don't want these GD proteins to just you know go around and lawnmower off all of our GPI anchored proteins. We want it to be specific for certain proteins and in, in certain contexts. And so um, cell type specificity could come from the peptide configuration. Uh, that's one possibility that could confer some specificity. I'm also interested in thinking about the uh, diversity of the GPI anchor itself. So within that um, glycan core of the GPI anchor, there are a number of other uh, carbohydrate and lipid modifications that can create diversity among the anchors themselves. So that could also be another mechanism of substrate specificity. Awesome. Uh, ben Slivka has a question. Are there any natal brain proteins that are proven not to be expressed in adult mice? That is, they have a role during development and then are turned off. Yeah, I think, I think there are a variety of them. Um, one that I want to point to actually is GD6. So in our, in our studies right now, we see very high enrichment of GD6 in the embryonic neural tube but a, a, a very negligible expression uh, postnatally. So the um, cells that, uh, you know, proteins that define some of these early progenitor niches, um, they're not always recycled into, into later time points. One thing I might say though, is that even low level of expression uh, later on, that could still have a big impact um, in terms of cleavage because one protein could go through and release multiple GPA anchor proteins. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions in the chat, but I'll throw in in there. I guess given the the role of um, the GDE two in continuing the maintenance of motor neurons, are there potential implications for these uh, in use of therapies or treatments of neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, I, I I would like to think so, right? And I think that's you know some of a large motivation for the work. The, um, you know, I could envision uh, therapeutic approaches that might be designed to rebalance that partitioning of GPI anchor proteins um, on the cell surface or um, released into the extracellular matrix. So for example, if um, the absence of a specific GPI anchor protein causes uh, cell death, the absence of the cleaved form, for example, then if we could engineer uh, secreted versions of those, pro uh, those peptides or other ways to amplify the um, GPI anchored release, that might uh, prove a useful therapeutic. Excellent, well, thanks so much, Clint. That was a great talk. Um, our next and final project talk of the day, uh, we'll focus on work um, from the transcriptomics and transgenic teams. Uh, their work has been foundational to uh, the Allen Institute uh, for Brain Science as a whole and is utilized by many other teams uh, at the Institute. Today, they will tell you about their recent work uh, outside of cortex, particularly in the thalamus, uh, as well as many other directions and applications of transcriptomic cell typing. So here's the transcriptomic team. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, I'm Zijian. It's a great honor and today for me to uh, represent the mouse transcriptome and transgenic team to give you an overview of our team talk today, which focused on the approach we use to build a, a whole uh, mouse brain cell type atlas. So the holy grail of our cell type program is to build the multimodal uh, <coughs> cell type taxonomy. So the general strategy we use is to starting from the single cell trans transcriptomic where and identify the cell types and uh, uh, identify the cell type specific markers. So based on those specific markers, we can build genetic tools uh, to access specific types and using the tools, we can characterize the cell types in these all the other data modality, including morphology, EFIS, and connectivity. So the other approach in, including patch seq and spatial transcriptomics. So in, in today's presentation, we're going to focus on transcriptome and methods and genetic tools, and to some extent, spatial transcriptomics. So uh, to give an overview of our session today, I will start with the introduction and, and tell you about a few trans taxonomy studies we have performed recently. And Cindy will zoom in uh, to the uh, cell type tax and diversities in thalamus. Amanda will tell you about genetic tools uh, for thalamus. And Jacqueline will describe uh, the strategies to generate and categorize the and transgenic and viral tools, while Alice uh, will um, discuss the ana analysis of brain-wide expression patterns using the tissue site imaging. And for the future directions, uh, Zhong Qing uh, will discuss our plans to study uh, cell types in aging and development, and Michael and Eileen will tell you about spatial transcriptomics. So I kick off this session to discuss our cortical hippocampus uh, study that we have uh, um, finished recently, which is submitted to bio -archi bioarchive and in review in, in cell right now. So this is a very large uh, taxonomy, which include uh, about 1.2 million cells collected in from uh, 15 different uh, cortical and hippocampal formation areas. Uh, and this in taxonomy, we ident identify 388 cell types. So here is a UMAP um, colored by the, the regions, particularly the hippocampal formation cells, uh, enterino, um, subiculum, and hippocampus are colored in different shades of green. And, and in the middle, you see the UMAP color by clusters. And, and we represent the relationship between the, uh, the cluster using a constellation diagram, uh, which uh, each cluster is positioned by the centroid in the UMAP and ed edges reflect uh, and the fraction of the nearest neighborship between uh, the types. And so we are partitioned the whole taxonomy into um, these several big neighborhoods. Um, for example, for the garbagic types, we separate into the MGE versus CGE derived um, 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 neurons. So I can't get into detail, but the one key observation we made in during this study uh, is that despite of the huge divergence of the hippocampal formation from the cortex, we can still establish some uh, conservation of homo homologous types between these two systems. And the organization principle that specify the cell types, there are uh, spatial like layer distribution and connectivity seems to be largely conserved as well. <laughs> So I'll switch gear to another study, the MOP mini Alice study, which has very different flavors. So in this study, instead of going for the depths, uh, instead of going for the breadth, we're going for the depths. So as a part of a large scale um, a BICCN um, um, a program, um, we're trying to collect uh, as many data modalities in single cortical regions, MOP, uh, as much as possible. Uh, so, um, using about half a million cells, uh, single cell and single nuclear uh, cells collected from uh, seven different um, platforms. We are able to build our conserved uh, consensus RNA-seq uh, transcriptome uh, taxonomy um, of 116 clusters. <coughs> And by integrating with um, uh, epigenetic data, including single cell DNA methylone and uh, our toxic data, uh, we can identify um, the cell type specific differential methylation side as well as the cell type specific enhancers. <laughs> 
So um, um, based on this uh, uh, consensus uh, transcriptome taxonomy, we can overlay the uh, information from all the other data, data modality. For example, using PatSeq and then connectivity data, we can specify the morphology and ethics feature of each of these types, uh, as well as the uh, projection patterns of particular for the uh, uh, glomatergic types. And, and the, um, the Murfish taxonomy and built by Drong's lab um, shows striking uh, concordance um, with the uh, transcriptal taxonomy that we built. And so for most of the cell types we identify, we can pinpoint exactly where the, they are located in MOP and we can quantify their abundance. Um, so, um, uh, we can also compare this transcriptome derived taxonomy with the integrated taxonomy using transcriptome and uh, um, epigenetic data as well. And again, the, the consistency is significant. And also compare with the cross species and taxonomy with human, mouse, and marmoset. And again, we see a very coherent view. So uh, to summarize, um, using this pilot study, we have demonstrated that it's indeed possible to uh, build one uh, multimodal uh, taxonomy um, using, uh, using all those um, uh, different data. And we are ready to um, scale up for the whole brain. <laughs> So um, um, now we are ready to, to go beyond cortex. And, and in this preliminary ta taxonomy, um, based on 143,000 smart sick cells, we identify uh, like um, 1,182 uh, clusters. So the, even though this, the cell number is not impressive in today's standards, the taxonomy is extremely complicated. And, and trying to annotate such co large com complicated taxonomy is a daunting task and uh, we'll adopt a kind of a divide and conquer approach. And uh, so, uh, so in, in this, and, and we can uh, project a, a kind of local taxonomy on this uh, um, big global taxonomy, taxonomy and observe a really intriguing transition of the cell types between across different brain areas. And this perspective is not easy, easy to gain when you look at looking at a local taxonomy. So um, going forward, thanks for the remarkable job done by our RNC core team led by Kim Smith. We are closing up in terms of data collection. We're almost done with the smart sick data with only a Sarah Bannum to uh, finish. And recently we have switched from 10X version two to 10X version three. And then we're almost uh, done with the uh, 10X uh, data collection as well. So in, in next year, we'll uh, wrap up data collection for the whole brain and uh, really excited to looking at this data and try to build a whole brain taxonomy. Next, I will I'll turn over to Cindy. We'll tell you about uh, thalamus. So one of the areas that we're focusing a little bit deeper on is mouse thalamus. And um, currently we have SmartSeq version four data ready and we are still processing 10X version three data. But for the data that we have ready, we have collected um, two broad ROIs and then switched over to 25 very fine ROIs to collect cells from thalamus. In total, we almost we collected almost 11,000 cells, which can be divided over 101 clusters. 26 of those are GABAergic, 63 are glutamatergic, and 12 are non-neuronal clusters. The gene detection level of these types is really high. We can detect almost 10,000 genes per cell per neuro, neuronal cell. On the right-hand side, you can see a UMAP colored by dissection region. And what is apparent on that is that you can definitely see specific islands from specific areas within thalamus. Looking into a little bit more detail, on the left-hand side, you can see the same UMAP, but now clustered by or colored by cluster. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, a constellation plot. So for each of the clusters, the cluster is represented by a disk. The size of the disk is proportional to the number of cells in that cluster. And the connecting lines um, represent a proportion of nearest neighbors between these pairs of clusters. What you can see from this is that there are definitely some very discrete islands by, um, that can be annotated by region. And there is a lot of interconnectedness between types, especially in the middle part. 
The red cluster represent GABAergic types, whereas the bluish clusters represent glutamatergic types. And I want to dive into, um, I want to highlight one specific area. This is a benula. We can annotate a very specifically, it is a very discrete ROI. It has a very specific gene expression pattern um, that can be verified by the ISH atlas that is available, available on the Allen Institute website. Um, it can be roughly divided into medial habenula, represented by this island, and lateral habenula, represented by this island. And there is one cluster in between that really represents a transition going from medial to lateral habenula. So our next steps will be to do a very similar analysis on the 10x version 3 data set, do a full annotation and integrate the two data sets. And with this, I want to turn it over to Amanda, who will talk about um, generating some thalamic tools. Hello, I'm Amanda Mitchell, and today I'm going to tell you about creating mouse thalamic viral tools. So I've been working on creating uh, thalamic viral tools by using Cindy's mouse single cell RNA-seq thalamus taxonomy and coupling it to publicly available single nuclei attack seq data. The single nuclei attack seq data that we're using comes from the RIN and ECHR labs via the VICCN initiative. They've dissected out individual cortical and subcortical regions and profiled over 800,000 nuclei. I've annotated these, this open chromatin data using the single cell taxonomies, um, first clustering by class, and then second clustering by division, subtype, or region. And then only for the cortex, doing a third level of clustering and annotating and clustering by supertype. The thalamic single nuclei ATAC seq data contains about 12,000 cells. The first clustering and annotation has been done by class um, and has a really high predictability for um, class level data um, for all of the cells. Um, from this, I filtered out a group of intermediate cells that were intermediate between excitatory and inhibitory classes. And then I did another round of clustering only for thalamic division. So looking at excitatory cells and clustering for core interlaminar or matrix cells. And from this, as you can see, most of the cells actually for this particular dissection come from the core. But I was also able to generate um, ATAC seq peak files and look at peaks um, around different core and matrix marker genes in the data and was able to see uh, specific peaks around PRKCD, which is one of the subclass markers for the thalamus, and also around um, KCNT2, which is um, another subclass, a different subclass marker in, um, that was found in the thalamic matrix cells. So in conclusion from this data, we'll be able to build thalamic viral tools for five different cell types in the thalamus, excitatory core and matrix cells, pan inhibitory cells, and pan non-neuronal cells. And in the future, we are looking into creating more single nuclei taxic data for mouse thalamus and to look at a variety of other regions um, in the thalamus and to create viral enhancer cell tools. So next, Jacqueline will tell you about characterizing transgenic mice and creation of other types of viral tools. Hi, uh, I'm Jacqueline Bendrick, and I'm also part of the mouse genetic tools team here at the Allen Institute. My talk is going to focus on how our team generates and characterizes novel transgenic and viral tools. This is an overview of our team's workflow for building state-of-the-art uh, mouse genetic tools. We start by mining large single-cell RNA-seq and single-cell ATAC-seq data sets from the Allen Institute to classify cell types in the mouse primary visual cortex. Once we have these types, we search for enhancers and marker genes for tool generation to gain access to these specific types. For generation of driver lines, we identify candidate genes from single cell RNA-seq datasets and then use CRISPR-Cas9 mediated targeting into the endogenous locus to add a CRE or flip cassette and engineered mouse ESLs. For viral tools, we clone enhancers identified from the single cell attack seq dataset into a viral backbone and generate recombinant adeno-associated viruses or AAVs. These AAVs can be easily administered via retroorbital injection 
where they're able to cross the blood-brain barrier and label specific cell types in the brain. Once we have generated these tools, we validate the labeling patterns with single-cell RNA-seq and RNA-scope. Here's an example of how we validated a new Tiger 3.0 reporter line, AI195, which expresses GCAMP7 slow for functional imaging of neuronal activity. We use RNA-scope, a single molecule in C2 hybridization assay to validate the specificity and completeness of GCAMP labeling of three major GABAergic interneuron types, SST, PVALB, and VIP. On the right, you see representative RNA-scope images um, from these three GABAergic crosses. As our Tiger 3.0 reporter lines are both CRE and FLIP dependent, these results are from triple crosses with SLC32A1, an inhibitory neuron driver line, and AI195. We then choose probes to label RNA from these major interneuron types, which are labeled in red, um, as well as GAD2, an inhibitory cell type marker labeled in blue, as well as the transgene GCAMP labeled in green. To evaluate the completeness of labeling with our new tools, we look at the proportion of cells in the population of interest, in this case, cells labeled with the subclass specific probe and GAD2, that are also labeled by GCAMP. Examples of triple labeled cells are highlighted with arrows in the figure. To evaluate specificity of labeling, we examine the proportion of cells labeled with the transgene, but not with the subclass specific marker and GAD2. As you can see in these figures, this new GCAMP line, AI195, is highly specific and mostly complete with all three of these major crosses. We repeat the same process for validating other new mouse lines, as well as novel viral tools. Hi, my name is Elise Morin. I'm also part of the Mouse Genetic Tools team, and I'll be discussing the analysis of whole brain expression patterns. Um, so we're currently developing an informatics pipeline for analyzing tissue site imaging data sets with the goal of quantifying individual nuclei within the defined regions and layers in the Allen mouse CCF to describe transgenic or viral tool labeling. Previously, we have relied on describing expression patterns as a density of expression in a given region using single cell filling fluorophore reporters. Determining the grand total of cell counts from such data um, is impossible given the contamination from axons and other processes. Nuclear quantification is attainable with the new dual nuclear fluorophore reporters that are part of the Tiger 3.0 combinatorial reporter platform. Uh, with fluorescence confined to the nucleus, we can more easily segment and quantify cells at single cell resolution. The first part of this method involves segmenting fluorescently labeled nuclei in the image. Uh, we've decided to perform this task using a UNET deep learning algorithm because of the unique structure, which allows us to combine high resolution feature information and spatial information. Um, and it's an algorithm that's widely used in biological image segmentation. This algorithm is trained on imaging data from AI224 animals, which express dual color nuclear fluorophores, EGFP and TD tomato. Tiles of these images that we use as training data are first manually annotated um, um, and using a, uh, a marching algorithm, we can expand the annotated centers of the cells to a label that defines the cell, its boundary um, and background beyond the cell, um, which serves as our ground truth. Once the unit is sufficiently trained on corresponding red-green image channels and their respective labels, we can use this algorithm to predict the classification of each pixel in an image, whether it's within a cell, the boundary of a cell, or the background. The second part involves registration of our data to the mouse CCF. Um, since we're quantifying cells, we can condense the output of our segmentation algorithm to just the coordinates of the centroid pixel of the cell. Um, and over the entire image and all the slices in the brain, uh, we have the coordinates of all identified nuclei in the brain in subject space. Um, as part of this registration, we perform two linear transformations, one to convert the coordinate space from pixel to micron, um, and in a fine, uh, fine transformation to perform translation, rotation, scaling, shearing to get the nuclei coordinates closer to CCF space. Um, and finally, we can invert the displacement field transform uh, to perform uh, a nonlinear transformation to make any vinyl minor adjustments um, for full registration to the CCF. Um, by registering this data, the coordinates of each nucleus in the CCF, um, uh, by registering this data, the coordinates of each nucleus 
um, to CCF space, we can now quantify uh, nuclei within the defined CCF annotations to describe brain mite expression patterns at single cell resolution. Um, and next, Ren will be discussing uh, future directions in cell types in aging and development. Hi, I'm King Zong Ren. I'm part of the mouse transcriptomics team at Molecular Genetics. Uh, I will talk about one future direction, cell types in development and aging. For development, we want to understand the following questions. How does cell types diversity emerge along the developmental act process? What is the developmental trajectory for different cell types based on single cell molecular measurements? Moreover, aging is the uh, most a major risk factor for neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. One of the most fundamental questions in brain aging research is whether aging affects all brain regions equally, or whether some brain regions or some cell types within those brain regions are more vulnerable to the effects of aging than others. Cataloging brain cell types and their connectivity in, mo in normal aging brain is fundamental to uncovering the mo uh, molecular mechanisms and the therapeutic opportunities for age-related brain disorders. For our experimental plan on the development side, we plan to collect cells from salamus and the WISP areas. And for postnatal day zero to 21, and perform single cell RNA-seq. At the same time, we'll perform SMART-seq uh, and also ATAC-seq at the P14 time point to generate an in-depth data that will help us decide whether to expand enhanced discovery to multiple points to capture large scale changes in the epigenetic landscape. On the aging side, we propose to utilize our well established omics pipeline to characterize and classify cell types in the 18 months old uh, mouse brain. And we will compare the results with the extensive brain-wide data sets that already generated in young adult mice, which is P56. We will use single nuclei, transcriptomics, and epigenomics to obtain a high-level survey of neuronal and non-neuronal cell types across the entire mouse brain. And then we will generate an in-depth single cell and spatial transcriptomics um, study to in brain areas that showed age-related changes uh, in our first uh, phase of the study. With that, I want to turn over to Eileen and Michael to discuss spatial transcriptomics. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Eileen, and uh, Michael and I will tell you about the future directions of spatial transcriptomics at Allen Institute. So at Allen Institute, we currently use MERFISH multiplex, multiplex error robust fluorescence in situ hybridization uh, to quantify the spatial gene expression at a cellular level. Uh, here, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the experiment and analysis we currently carry out at our institute. Uh, we use MOP as an example. Uh, so this is um, uh, MOP single cell, single nuclear analytic analysis from uh, Zhen's mini atlas study. 258 genes were selected to differentiate the cell types inside MOP. And then Allen Institute image team will select an uh, area inside MOP and perform the imaging. With the analysis, we then mapped every cell in MERFISH to single cell or single nuclear RNA seq uh, cell types. So combining the spatial transcriptomics and single cell, single nuclear RNA seq, we are able to explore the cell types inside MOP at a class subclass or cluster levels. For example, if we check the glutamatergic cell classes and we can see each cell subclass uh, should a clear distribution by each layer. 
but and if we check out GABA urgent cell class, uh, each cell subclass will uh, scatter around in the slice. Uh, I will uh, hand over to Michael to tell you more about uh, uh, the other areas we are going to check out with spatial transcriptomics. Uh, thank you, Yilin. So the general workflow being established, we are now focusing on sampling additional brain regions in the future. However, before we do that, we first uh, want to repeat imaging on the primary motor cortex to make sure that the whole process is running smoothly and we can repeatedly generate reliable results. Uh, once this is done, uh, our next focus is on the primary visual cortex, a region that has historically been heavily studied within the Allen Institute for Brain Science. So there's a big need for more information about the localization of individual transcriptomic cell types. Um, next, we are planning to move away from the isocortex to sample the hippocampus, a region important for memory formation. In addition, we are also planning to image the subcortical region, in this case, the amygdala, uh, a region that is heavily involved in the processing and response to aversive stimuli. Uh, last but not least, we will also image human tissue. We will focus on the bit temporal gyrus, a higher order association area. This area is also heavily affected by Alzheimer's disease and we plan to image samples from healthy donors as well as those afflicted by this terrible disease. I hope this will help us gain a better understanding of the molecular changes that happen in neurons afflicted by Alzheimer. With this, uh, I would like to end the presentation. I would like to thank the members of the team for their great work, as well as the rest of the Allen Institute for Brain Science for creating such a collaborative atmosphere. Big thanks also go to our founder, Paul Allen, for his leadership and vision that enables us to perform this groundbreaking research. And of course, you for your attention. Great. Thanks to the uh, transcriptomics and transgenics teams for a great project talk. Um, again, we won't be doing a live Q&A for these. Uh, so if you want to drop a question for them uh, in the community forum, check out the link in the chat window. Uh, our final speaker today is uh, Fena Creedon, one of our 2020 Next Generation leaders. Fena is a postdoctoral fellow in Steve McCarroll's lab in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. She received her BA in Cognitive Science from University of California at Berkeley and did her doctoral work again at Harvard with uh, Randy Buckner using non-invasive neuroimaging in large human cohorts to infer functional connectivity in the cerebral cortex and cerebellum. Before joining the McCarroll Lab, she was a Brain Mind Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study of Human Paleobiology at the George Washington University with Chet Sherwood where she developed an analytic approach for jointly analyzing human neuroimaging and microarray micro data to reveal transcriptional correlates of large scale connectivity. Fena uses single nucleus DNA uh, and RNA sequencing across mammalian species to understand how brain cell types have evolved and to build better links between human genetics and animal models. Her talk today is titled, Innovations Present in the Primate Interneuron Repertoire. Welcome to Fena and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Stephanie, so much. Um, it's really wonderful to uh, be here. And I wanna thank the, the organizers of the symposium, uh, the coordinators, the event coordinators for keeping us all in line. And I'd also extend a thank you to the previous cohorts of NGLs who have made us um, new kids feel so welcome in this group. Um, this is a tremendously exciting time to be studying the human brain. And I say this as someone who studied it from a variety of different approaches, as you heard. And I have to say, people who study the human brain have often had quite a bit of FOMO when we, um, when we think of the power of, of mouse genetics, when we think of the exquisite control um, that, that Yvette uh, is able to control and monitor her specific cell types and flies, and, uh, and, and that Clint has, has shown with his knockouts in the, um, developing uh, mouse and chick brain. And the challenge really has been that the human brain and other primates as well are just vexingly inaccessible. So we haven't been able to make those same measurements to even establish what is um, evolutionarily conserved and, and what, it, what might be innovated at the molecular or cell type level. And um, from first principles, you might think that uh, 
a new uh, a, a non-human primate, such as an adorable marmoset that you see here, uh, might be uh, better able to recapitulate aspects of human relevant biology. But again, the question is, um, you know, from the standpoint of a human geneticist, how do we know that the, the risk factor, uh, genetic risk factor that we've identified as being associated with a human disease, uh, such as autism, is going to carry over to any of these other models. Um, and so let's, uh, let's bring unbiased and high throughput data to bear uh, from any species, the human brain included, to ask this, these kinds of questions of conservation on a level playing field. And that's really what makes me so excited about single cell um, sequencing approaches, whether it be for RNA or DNA increasingly for protein, because for the first time we can really make those same measurements in any species and ask that question about conservation and innovation. A lot of the work that I'll show you today um, is really enabled by our participation in the uh, Brain Initiative Cell Census Network and the Allen Institute has done, um, uh, played a large role in convening this network. So we're developing a cellular and molecular atlas of the marmoset brain working um, with, with Guoping Feng at MIT. And, and the hope is that we can bring um, these kinds of resources for the broader community to start to ask those questions of model selection and conservation. The data that, uh, the, the story that I wanna share with you today really focuses on one major class of neuron, interneurons, which as you well know, are beautifully uh, diverse and morphologically, functionally, in terms of the specific niches that they um, that they occupy in different brain structures, and yet everything that we have learned so far from the single cell sequencing, particularly RNA sequencing um, uh, literature, has led us to expect them to be largely conserved across species, right? And this really started with Maria's beautiful work showing what is is possible in the comparative aspect of. Uh, uh, comparing say uh, reptiles, turtles and lizards to mice, or and a lot of Trigva and, and Rebecca and, and Ed's work comparing mouse to human and now adding non-human primates. The emphasis has been that um, interneurons are, are broadly conserved as a class and it's the excitatory glutamatergic types that are more um, divergent. And we and others, um, and this is really beautifully shown in Basilica's paper, have also observed that within a given structure in the mouse, say the neocortex, you tend to find higher conservation of the genetic programs within conserved interneuron types in different um, neocortical areas. And so all of this led us to think, well, this is a really conservative place to focus if we wanna look for these uh, questions of innovation and conservation across um, species. But another thing happened around the time that we were launching this project, which is fortuitous for us. And that is that Gord Fischel, who uh, was many years at NYU, moved his operation up to um, the Broad Institute and, and Harvard. And um, I like to think of him as the ambassador of interneurons. And he really uh, sort of told me, hey, take another closer look at those interneurons. They might be livelier than you first um, expect. And it turns out that his intuition uh, was, was worth paying attention to. You know, one fascinating thing about interneurons to their favor is that they're immigrants. Um, within the, the interneuron classes destined for the neocortex, for instance, they're largely born within these ganglionic eminence structures that are transient. They have to migrate and follow these torturous um, paths of, of both tangential and radial migration to, to, to take up their final positions in the mature uh, neocortex. They have to avoid the siren song of the striatum in some cases. And so they have a lot of decisions to make to figure out where to go and how to do it precisely. And, and might it be the case that evolution actually has uh, quite a lot of uh, arsenal of tools at its disposal to, to modify and reallocate and, and change this class of, um, uh, of cell, e even though we think in at least respect to the glutamatergic types that they're largely conserved. And so our story starts with a small menagerie of species, a, a few uh, regions, many, many single nucleus RNA-seq libraries. But then of course, ultimately, we're just gonna be exploring um, what we found from the interneurons. So these are the GAD1 or GAD2 positive um, types from these data sets. But whatever your cell type, you take a step back and you think, well, how might brain cells types evolve? And you, get, and you can draw up a admittedly simple list, which is what we did. Actually, we only thought of three of these possibilities, but then nature provided the fourth. But the first is you could just change the abundance of a conserved type 
You could change the molecular uh, details of genetic program of a conserved type. You could allocate the same type differently across contexts. And then the most provocative one, of course, is inventing a novel type. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the vignettes from the latter three examples, although the first one is by no means insignificant. We find lots of examples of this as well. OK, so let's focus just on the neocortex. And one thing that turns out to be very useful is that the uh, interneuron classes in the neocortex in all of the species that we assayed can uh, largely mutually exclusively be partitioned into four major categories. There's actually also a fifth, but these are the four major ones that um, account for nearly 100% of neocortical interneurons. And what's convenient about them is that in all species that we assayed, they uh, can be marked by the same canonical markers, parvalbumin, somatostatin, you know well, ID2, which is largely neurogliaform types of interneurons, and then the VIP positive subclasses. So you've seen a lot of these, um, these uh, TSNE or UMAP plots before. Each cell is a, is a dot and their uh, transcriptional similarity dictates their, whether they're clustered similarly close together on the, on the, on the two-dimensional projection. But here I've colored them by their, by their expression, which is again, mutually exclusive, um, nearly completely amongst these four classes. So this conservation at this level is really convenient because then we can go in and ask, okay, for each, um, for each conserved class, how lively are our gene expression program changing, cha how, how lively are they changing amongst and across species? So here's, here, this is what illustrates um, one major type of change that we observe. So this is the gene NTNG1, which in mice is enriched in the parvalbumin um, subtypes, but there's a qualitatively different shift in the, in the primates, and you see it primarily in the ID2 positive subtypes. You can also express these kinds of species comparisons by taking pairs of species. For instance, here the, 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 uh, the human levels of NRG1 are arrayed on the x-axis amongst the four conserved classes. And then on the uh, y-axis are each of the non-human species. What you can see is that the non-human primates, so those are the two plots on the right, uh, really nicely recapitulate the relative expression levels of NRG1 within these classes. But that is not so for the ferret and the, um, and the mouse, so the two non-primate species that we assayed. And these two examples, you can go march through this one gene at a time, but they really illustrate the genes that we think of as normal for, uh, as essential for normal brain function can still yet exhibit quite a lot of shifts among, uh, in their quantitative expression levels amongst more closely or more distantly related um, species. There's another way to look at this instead of one gene at a time, though we can look at the whole uh, at the, at the whole gene genome level and ask for any gene that is expressed in interneurons, how conserved is, it, is its quantitative expression levels? And for those who are interested in human disease, for instance, we can take a step further and say, let's just consider those genes that have in human populations shown evidence of loss of function and tolerance. This is this PLI metric. And that means they're dosage sensitive in human populations. And because these are often genes, known disease associated genes, you might think, that even uh, something that is far removed from us, like a mouse, may yet have highly constrained quantitative levels of expression of these amongst conserved um, neuronal classes. But actually, it turns out that um, primate primate pairs, so comparing the quantitative levels within primates, is still much more similar um, than the mouse to primate pairs, which is what you see in the red in the blue curve. Sorry here. And that really suggests that um, evolution actually really constrains the quantitative expression levels, even of loss of function and tolerant genes, but especially at those shorter evolutionary timescales that, um, that separate primates from one another. Okay, I want to visit another way that we explored how genetic programs of conserved types might vary. And this goes back to this observation that Basilica made in her 2018 paper, and it was also an observation that we'd made in her own mouse work, um, which is that, again, relative to glutamatergic cell types, GABAergic interneuron classes seem to be largely invariant in the neocortex, whether you sample from a frontal region like ALM or a posterior region like VISP. And because, at least in the, in the marmoset data sets, which was, again, enabled, this large collection enabled by the BICCN, we had acquired seven different neocortical regions. So we could really just ask that same question, but in a primate context. And if you take any pair of these two, uh, 
any two of these neocortical regions and find the conserved interneuron subtypes and then measure the, the magnitude or number of differentially expressed genes within each class or subtype level. Um, you can find what seems to be a larger magnitude of differentially expressed genes um, than we see uh, when we observe in our own data in mouse. Um, so it seems that the first conclusion is that primates may specialize locally their neocortical repertoire of interneurons to a greater degree than say a, a mouse. But these analysis also revealed an unexpected spatial logic to this type of, of variation by cortical location. And the way we observed this was by taking all of the differentially expressed genes between the prefrontal cortex and V1, and then asking what are, what are their expression levels of all the regions that are interposed in between those two poles along the anterior posterior extent. And here I'm showing you six genes that we've pulled out that show what looks like a spatial logic, what looks like a, a gradient, if you will, of expression, either from high to low, from the anterior to the posterior pole, or from low to, to high in the, uh, in the other direction. And, um, and this was really unexpected uh, because it really suggests that there's a, a large spatial gradient, potentially. Uh, I don't know if it's a linear gradient or if there's a more complex uh, set of factors that, that control variation across the neocortical, different neocortical areas, particularly of different types. Um, but uh, this is just showing data from a parvalbumin subtype. The other subtypes also show different sets of dozens to hundreds of genes that show these gradients. Um, and we could validate some of these candidates with single molecule fish, showing, for ex example, um, that ASS1, which the single nucleus RNA-seq data predicted to be high in prefrontal cortex within parvalbumin interneurons specifically, was undetected in the parvalbumin neurons in the posterior pole, and quantifying the, the whole sagittal section single molecule fish images sort of corroborated this notion of a, of a, a spatial gradient. And of course, that, that awakens the imagination of um, how the interneurons encode this aspect of their spatial position across the neocortical mantle. Is it developmentally regulated? Is it regulated by other cell types, uh, activity dependent? So these are all really exciting questions to think about when you think about neocortical specialization in the primate. Okay, I wanna to turn to another way that we um, observed variation amongst conserved cell types. So this was a cool one. This is a, a, a cryptic population of LAMP5. So these are the ID2 type, prim primarily thought of as neurogliaform-like um, positive subtypes of interneurons, which we observed to be more numerous in the primates, both the non-human primates and, and primates in all cortical areas um, compared to the mouse. And this was an observation that Rebecca and Trigve had also made in, in their paper last year uh, comparing mouse to human. So it seems to be invariant across the, the primates and in all regions that we sampled. Um, but this is a strange population. And I remember uh, explicitly sitting in Gord's office and saying, you know, this pattern of gene expression really doesn't make sense. You have a LAMP5 type, which seems to cluster with the CGE derived other neurogliaform-like types. And yet it also expresses LHX6, which as you know, is a transcription factor indicative of MGE origin. And Gord had this insight and said, you know, might it be possible that if you looked elsewhere in the mouse brain, that you might find a transcriptional cousin, if you will, of cells that are not numerous, as you can see here in the mouse neocortex, might be numerous elsewhere in the mouse brain. And he was really uh, uh, invoking this, this notion of how lively interneurons are in terms of their development, right? So I showed you before that, or reminded you before that interneurons are immigrants originating from these transient proliferative structures, but also that the same progenitors from say the MGE give rise not just to interneurons that populate the neocortex, but also the hippocampus and the stridum and, and some other subcortical cell types. And so that intuition really led us to this analysis where we pooled all of our um, interneurons from this adult mouse brain atlas that our lab was working on at the time, uh, pooled all the interneurons from there and simply asked, is there a cognate type in, elsewhere in the mouse brain that might match this LAMP5 LHX6 primate transcriptomic profile? And the answer here was just unambiguous. Um, it turns out that the, the vast majority of cells that match this transcriptomic type originate from the, or are found in the mouse hippocampus um, and very few from the mouse neocortex. 
we then sampled the ferret. And so the model here is that these cells are, are, are large, largely represented in the hippocampus in all species, but have only expanded in the, in the primates uh, and not so in the ferret and mouse of the neocortex. And then our collaborators fate mapped this population and determined that it, there's a common MGE origin for those cells in the mouse that have this transcriptomic profile and that are destined for the hippocampus and then very sparsely also for the neocortex. Okay, so the last vignette that I'll show you from this project is really this question of um, inventing a novel type, right? So um, here we sort of counterintuitively to us uh, found ourselves in the striatum. And the striatum, as you know, is this uh, deeply uh, forms a comprises a component of the basal ganglia, a deeply conserved uh, set of brain nuclei, and they're so conserved that that others have sort of emphasized that the basic cell types and their molecular repertoires have been largely invariant. Of course, we know there are exceptions, but largely invariant between mammals, say a mouse, and, and fish over hundreds of millions of years. And so we thought of this almost as a control, not expecting to find so much diversity or innovation within any one species, within interneurons of the striatum. Um, and so it was quite a surprise to us that we uh, first identified all of the major interneuron types of the striatum that have already been described in the mouse. But then we also identified a, um, a unique population in the marmoset that we couldn't find a cognate type for in the mouse. And in the marmoset, this expressed a neuropeptide, TAC3 prominently. It's one of the best markers, but there are others as well. VIP is one. In general, it expresses this combination of neuropeptides, um, other genes, transcription factors that we couldn't find a match for in any other region of the marmoset brain or indeed any other region of the mouse brain that we've sampled so far. Um, we found them all over the striatum and the primate and the cauda, putamen, nucleus accumbens. And transcriptionally, they sort of situate themselves in between what are very conserved cell types and are all also known to be MGE derived. So these are the somatostatin positive, NPY positive subtypes, and the TH or parvalbumin positive subtypes. So they're probably of, of MGE lineage. Um, but beyond that, it's quite mysterious to think about where they might come from. This is not something freaky that just marmosets do. Uh, it turns out that they comprise a large proportion of human striatal interneurons as well, some 30% in both primate species that we assayed. And again, we didn't detect them at a cognate type in mouse or in ferret, suggesting this might be a gain in the lineage leading to um, modern primates. So I just want to summarize this part of the talk by saying that I showed you I, I showed you three ways, but there are four ways that we describe in this in this work, in in which um, evolution has repurposed conserved types or even evolved novel types in um, within primates compared to to rodents and and ferrets to mice and ferrets, and I think even we sort of underestimated that the lively way that interneurons can be repurposed and and can evolve. But moving forward, I mean, this, this just leaves open a whole host of really exciting questions, I think. I mean, how many other cell type innovations might we find that are shared amongst primates that are potentially unique to humans? Um, I didn't show any examples of, of human unique uh, um, properties, but, um, but, but they're probably there and we should find them. Uh, but we only sampled, as I mentioned, a, a fairly narrow range of the um, both uh, phylogenetic tree a species tree and also of the cell type taxonomy, just focusing again on interneurons. And I think um, moving forward, many others are also uh, pushing this, this field of sort of compar a comparative perspective forward from the single nucleus uh, data sets, which are so valuable. And Ed, Ed and Trig and, and Nick and, and Rebecca are really taking this forward in exciting ways, both sampling more diverse species and a more wider range of, of brain regions. But from these um, comparative uh, stories, I think a couple of principles have already been distilled. I mean, the first is that human cell, uh, uh, novel cell types are um, remarkably rare. So they're probably the exception and not the rule to in species specific innovation. And the second is that the, our favorite markers, the ones that we hold dear in any one species will not necessarily translate well to, to, to another one. Although there seem to be core features of conserved types that are nonetheless conserved um, and stable. And the third is that um, Species proximity, so evolutionary proximity, is usually a good predictor 
of similarity, but there are really interesting exceptions to that. I didn't go into many of them in, in this talk, but we found characterized some in our, our work, and I think moving forward, you'll see a lot more of those um, interesting exceptions to the rule moving forward. Um, so I just want to show you in the last few minutes where we're going with this program. I mean, going back to this really exciting and sort of intriguing population of striatal interneurons that we that we found in the, in the marmoset and human and that may be primate specific. They're very numerous. We, we see them in, in multiple striatal compartments. And, but we have many questions about them. So um, what are their synaptic partners? What is their function? How do they integrate into what may be otherwise largely conserved circuits? Um, and, and where do they come from and, and when? And the challenge of studying something that is um, uniquely primate, right, is the, is the lack of tools that we have to study uh, and characterize cell types at a, at a, um, at a really specific level in relatively non-genetically accessible species. And that's what makes us so excited, uh, exciting, uh, it's so exciting to consider that there is sort of a new frontier of, um, of reagents that are cell type specific, but are also amenable to, to less genetically accessible species. And here I'm thinking of the class of adeno associated viral uh, vector tools, where you can modify the genetic payload of the virus to contain a regulatory element like an enhancer that can drive the expression of say a reporter, uh, a fluorescent protein like GFP. And therefore you can obtain um, cell type specific uh, um, selectivity of, of labeling or eventually control of particular neurons. And this could work as a, of course, form of, of gene therapy, of, of vaccine delivery. And so this is a really exciting class that you heard a lot about yesterday in the human cell types and viral tools um, program uh, showcase. So it turns out, luckily for us, that about four or five years ago, Jordan Dimmenstein had already published a um, an enhancer uh, viral vector a construct that is, uh, at least in neocortex, had been shown to be pan-interneuronal, so pretty high specificity, um, and that was conserved both at a sequence level and, and was efficacious in both uh, mice, which is where it was first identified, but also then carried over and demonstrated to work also in non-human primates and humans. So he calls this the MDLX enhancer. And this is really perfect for our needs, right? because we can use a, a construct like this to try to identify a cell type like this, right? And so we tried this. We did systemic injections um, in collaboration again with Guoping Feng's lab of, of this construct uh, with an AAV9 stereotype in the marmoset's uh, brain and then stained with single molecule fish uh, for the molecular markers that may help us identify which interneuron type was labeled um, by, this, by this vector. And over hundreds of, of images and lots of sampling, to our surprise, we could identify literally every other interneuron type that we know to exist from the RNA-seq um, uh, data in the primate striatum, but never co-localization with GFP and the molecular markers of the type that we were actually trying to find, which is this TAC3 positive um, striatal type. So, um, so this was a, a puzzle to us. And this is what um, instigated us to, to collect our own uh, single nucleus attack seq data, which you've heard a little bit about in different um, showcase presentations already. But this can help us find uh, uh, segments of open chromatin and DNA that may serve as, as candidate enhancers. Uh, and if they're cell type specific, then we could package them in AAVs as, as I showed and, and, and drive gene expression, say your reporter expression. So we did this in the marmoset, um, focusing on, on several brain regions, but here's just showing the striatum integrated with RNA-seq data so we could learn the cell type uh, class labels. And with these data in hand, we finally found our answer for why we were unable to use the MDLX enhancer to label our specific cell type. So it turns out in this case that for whatever reason, when we lift over the MDLX enhancer uh, location coordinates to the marmoset genome, we see a beautiful read pileup for all the other interneuron types in the striatum. And for whatever reason, it's lacking in our, um, inter our interneuron type of, of interest. And this is this TAC3 type that we've been trying to characterize. Um, so, but of course, now we have these data in the non-human primates directly, and we can start to define 
our own differentially accessible peaks that may well serve as great candidates um, to package into AAVs and then drive expression, particularly within the interneuron type that we're, we're attending to characterize. And I just wanna say that yesterday's uh, program describing the progress of the human cell types uh, program and the viral tools that are being produced by Boaz Levy and Jonathan Ting's group, I think will really advance this field forward, um, focusing both on what is conserved across species, but also those interesting exceptions. Um, when, you, when you think a tool will work in a conserved way, and then it turns out for some interesting and mysterious reason to not work the way that you expected. Um, but we got a bit greedy after this. We have all this ataxic data. We can identify candidate enhancers from any cell type in our uh, region of interest. And so actually what we'd like, and this is, I think, in large part, the goal of the, of the um, Human Cell Types Viral Tools pro Program too, to construct an AAV enhancer and construct for any primate um, neuron type that we might be interested in following up or cell type that is amenable to this kind of work. But then the question is a practical one. Um, how do you test and validate you know, hundreds of enhancers? in a non-human primate context, where it's just not feasible um, to use one animal for each injection or a, a limited number to, to test only a limited number of enhancers per animal. And so we settled on this workflow, and this is a collaboration again with Guoping and our lab and, and um, Partha Mitra's lab at Cold Spring Harbor, using an approach that was similar to one um, shown last year by the Greenberg lab in mouse where we identify through single nucleus, ataxic, and RNA-seq, our candidate enhancers in our regions of interest. We then create a, a, a library where the enhancer and a minimal promoter drives the expression of GFP, but we've added a DNA barcode at the end, um, just five prime of the polyadenylation sequence. And this, each uh, barcode is associated with a, a unique enhancer. And what this enables us to do is then pool our AAV injections meaning that either systemically or by local injection, we could potentially query maybe dozens of enhancers in the same uh, uh, dissection. We then sort and sequence just the green cells, and we can then by sequencing both ascertain the viral RNAs that were, uh, viral mRNAs that were transcribed, as well as the host cell identity uh, that accommodated that transcription and learn then the cell type specific uh, enhancer uh, uh, matching. So we only have preliminary data now. This is early days in the mouse, but I think this, this strategy is going to be quite um, promising. So we've injected these uh, systemic cocktails of viruses from uh, candidates nominated from mouse attack seek and RNA seq data. And then after a period of incubation, we uh, freeze the tissue and perform single nucleus RNA seq. Then we can read uh, the host cell identity by uh, by the host cells mRNAs, as well as detect the barcodes associated with unique enhancers. So I'm just showing three enhancers here. Two of them, the red and blue ones, are um, cell type specific. This one seems to be enriched in interneurons. This one's enriched in spiny projection neurons. Um, and then there's one spe non-specific enhancer for comparison that seems to um, be uh, detected in multiple cell classes. And here's another representation of those data where the cell type is arrayed on the x-axis of these data here. And you can detect the, the average number of viral mRNAs detected per cell class, showing there's high specificity for this barcode within parvalbumin striatal interneurons and high specificity of this one within ISBNs of the striatum, as well as a, a, a smaller contribution of the really rare NPY interneuron types. Um, so we're now doing this in the, in the non-human primate in the marmoset, and, and we're hoping that this will scale well with our, you know, with our ambition to be able to have a flexible set of tools or arsenal for, for non-human primate um, research. So I just want to end where I started, right, which is what seemed originally like a challenge of, of modeling um, human brain biology maybe looks a little bit more like opportunities for modeling human brain biology. Now that we can bring um, this large uh, and exciting uh, uh, arsenal of unbiased RNA sequencing data at the single cell uh, resolution and level um, to bear also with, with tools that we can then target in cell type specific ways can really uh, open up the possibilities for um, choosing your model in, in a rational way and, and matching the the biological question to the to the appropriate species at the level of conservation you're 
you're looking for. So really excited about this program moving forward. And finally, I just want to thank um, my lab, uh, Steve McCarroll, my mentor, and all of our collaborators for, for these um, projects that I've shown you today. Thanks so much for listening, and I'm, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, Fana. That was great. Um, we've got one question here to start from, uh, I'm going to, sorry for butchering this name, Nana Batia Day. Uh, is there any information available about interneurons in the olfactory system? Oh, that's a really, that's a really great question. And I assume you mean in the primate context. Um, and I, I personally am not a, aware of any uh, work exploring the diversity of interneuron types in the olfactory system. I think one, one thing that we tend to do when we, we're studying primates is to focus on the sensory systems that have been dramatically elaborated in our model species and ignore the ones that have diminished. And unfortunately, one thing that is greatly diminished in the primates, of course, as you probably know, is the, the olfactory bulbs in the larger olfactory system. And, and in contrast, we have a lot of work at a systems level and understanding the, um, the circuits and, and cell types of the visual system. So I think that that is, that is sort of driven by where we tend to look, but I think it would be a great question and a great thing to, to pursue to try to understand interneurons in these other sort of understudied um, sensory systems. Great, uh, I've got a few more here that are coming in from uh, Dr. Yasmin Escobeda Lazoya. A very interesting vignette on the striatum. He's wondering if, have you found evidence of cell type innovation in other previously assumed to be uniform regions? Uh, cerebellum spef specifically comes to mind since it was long assumed to be mainly involved in locomotor behavior, but more recently has been discovered to be important for regulation of emotion involved in pathogenesis, uh, autism spectrum disorders. Yeah, that is a fantastic um, question, Yasmin. And the cerebellum is something that, that um, at, again, at the systems level, uh, primate neurobiologists have long uh, suspected to be uh, elaborated in an interesting way. So for example, um, what, what what has been shown is that there are uh, long range polysynaptic loops, just as there are loops from motor cortex through the thal thalamus and relay nuclei uh, to motor regions of the cerebellum. There are so too uh, loops from lateral parietal association cortex and prefrontal cortex um, uh, to the cerebellum in the primate. And these have actually dramatically expanded in the lateral hemispheres of the cerebellum. And I think the really interesting question is um, from those data is, do we really believe this canonical microcircuit model? Or might there also be uh, interesting elaboration at the molecular or cell type level that confer, confers that functional specificity to some degree? Or is it just totally dr uh, driven by the, the sort of parallel loops that are going to different parts of the cerebral cortex and, and communicating with different functional zones? And so I know Evan McCosco has done some beautiful work in characterizing pr uh, primarily the mouse cerebellum at the single cell level and has identified some novel uh, types, including some interneuron types that have different lobular um, uh, specificity, even in a, in a species for which we expected the uniformity to be sort of uh, more true. He's still found some, some interesting innovation in cell type levels within the mouse. So now the question is, do we see the same or do we see some, some more elaborations in the primate? I think that's a fantastic question, I'm, but I'm not sure what the answer is. Yeah, great. Um, we've got a question from Basilica here. Great talk, Fena. Does the enhancer that labels TAC3 neurons in primate label anything in mouse? Yeah, that is a great question. So the, the enhancer sequence is conserved in the mouse genome. Um, uh, but but we, had, we only have a little bit of mouse ataxic data, so obviously we should go and look in, in the larger corpus of ataxic data that now exists for mouse. But at least in the striatum, we don't find any peak in any cell type in the mouse. And in the other cortical regions that we've assayed in the mouse, we also don't, we don't find any uh, enhancer peak within any cell type. Um, so that's not to say that it doesn't exist somewhere else. And of course, TAC3 is a great marker for, for, sort of for like lateral habenulas. It's the, the, the cognate um, gene is TAC2 in mice. Um, so there are plenty of other places where we expect uh, TAC3 and one of those, actually one of those great candidates just sits outside of the promoter of TAC3 um, in, this, in the striatal type that we're trying to characterize. So it, it will be a really interesting question to see if it's 
yet repurposed in some other region that has a prominent population of similar interneurons, uh, similar cells, but we haven't, we haven't found it yet in our mouse data. The search continues. Um, got a question from Forrest. Uh, I found a really amazing amount of work. This is obviously a problem that I've overheard discussed at the Allen, but in screening for enhancers of rarer sparse cell types, what ideas do you have to avoid wasting single cell sequencing on failed enhancers with broader expression and thus larger DFP positive populations within the pooled experiment? Oh, I mean, that's a great question. There's something that I know that Alan is probably debating a lot. And in the Q&A, there was, there was a really interesting discussion yesterday uh, about this, but the question is about um, enhancer prioritization. I mean, some of the enhancer candidates that seem most compelling and most cell type specific lie in these like gene poor deserts or in the middle of introns that have no obvious uh, genes that have no obvious expression relationship and yet because of three-dimensional conformational features may yet end up being important or they could be total red herrings and i think the same so i think our approach uh, and most approaches have been deliberately conservative so we use a couple of of pieces of evidence that we have immediately within the data that we've already collected. So is, is the enhancer proximal to, the, to a gene that is expressed in that cell type? Is that a cell uh, gene expression relatively cell type specific? That would be the best case. Um, and then we, we sort of put a, an extra prior on those, on, on those candidates. But I think a screen in a, screening in a more high throughput manner, such as bar barcoding, if we can indeed scale this up to hundreds of enhancers, I'd love to throw in some of those candidates that aren't well corroborated by any of the evidence that we have so far. And, and that gives us an opportunity to learn um, whether some of those um, uh, candidates for which we don't have good information or good evidence may nonetheless be, nonetheless be um, specific in some way. The non-specific ones, I think, for the purposes of trying to develop tools, we purposely avoid them, right? But it'd be nice to throw some of those in there too and see whether there actually is a cell type specificity. There are all sorts of freaky examples of the sequence not being conserved and yet the enhancer still works across species or the sequence being observed and the, the chromatin is open and yet it, it works in a totally different way than you predicted from the RNA-seq or the attack-seq. So we, we, have a, we have a lot of investigation to do. And I think that again would be the value of scaling up and, and trying some of the, the otter candidates that we observe. Yeah, great. I've got a few more here um, from Peter Burbach. Is the expression of TAC neuropeptides by TAC plus interneurons mirrored by the expression of receptors in striata cell, striatum cells? Oh, this is a great question, yeah. Um, well, we, yeah, we, we did a little bit of that investigation to see if we could uh, try to predict who, which synaptic partners this cell type might have. So for instance, uh, the cholinergic interneurons, which is, as you know, are very sparse, these huge sparse cells in the stratum, um, they, they, they have uh, the TAC3 receptor. And so you might think, okay, well, maybe there's, there's some synaptic uh, relationship between those two, but those are very sparse. The, the, the TAC3 interneurons, relatively speaking, are extremely numerous. Um, and so we don't yet know, and we haven't done these, um, we haven't done any, any uh, investigations to see if there's co-localization in any interesting way. Um, but, the, but those are some questions that we're trying to, 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 to back, back out just from the transcriptomic data that we have while we await some other confirmations from the cell type specific uh, program that we're doing now. Great, I think we've got time for one more and this one looks like kind of a big one from Kathy Murphy. Uh, what kind of complexity do you think is added by looking at development or aging? Oh, so much complexity. In fact, I'll say that when Gord first arrived at, at um, up here, he tried to convince me to study both species uh, evolution of, of interneuron types and development at the same time. And it quickly became just too many factors to control at once because how do you even stage a, a mouse development with respect to primate development? So many periods have been dilated and expanded and you know, um, Barb Finley and, and Christine Charvet have done a lot of work in trying to match developmental time points, but ultimately really specific cell types might take very um, at disparate trajectories in terms of developmental lineage and, and the decisions they, that they make across species. So I think development is the place to look. We're also really interested in aging in, from the primate perspective. Of course, they live a lot longer than, um, than uh, mouse models, which might make them attractive for aging. 
marmosets in particular live long but not so long that you that they might also be a really attractive way um, to, to study neurodegeneration and aging. Um, but those are those are extra dimensions that we need to build on once we have you know the basic atlas, which is what we're trying to do now. Great question. Great. Well, thanks, Fena, for your very interesting talk. It spurred a lot of questions, and there's a few more for you here uh, in the Q&A, which I'll let you uh, peruse and, and answer at your leisure. Um, that concludes our second day of the Showcase Symposium. Thanks to all of you for uh, watching and attending and for all of your great questions. Um, the public webinar is going to uh, end momentarily. Um, all attendees are welcome to uh, visit the Ellen Brain Map Community Forum to put in questions for the project talks. Um, and there should be a link in the chat for you to uh, find that. Um, thanks again to our NGL speakers, Yvette, Clint, and Fena, and to the project teams um, for all the, the work that went into putting these talks together and presenting them with us today. Um, our final day of showcase is tomorrow. We'll have uh, four project talks, as well as uh, remarks by Christoph Koch and uh, Hong Kui Zhang. Uh, we hope you will join us. And as always, we wish to thank our late founder, Paul G. Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. Uh, for Allen Institute employees and NGLs, um, you'll see a Q&A session and roundtable uh, calendar invite, and you can proceed there to continue on with the showcase proceedings. Thanks all. Have a good day.